Good evening, everybody. It is Saturday, April 6th, 2024. I am here with Jude Morrow, the author of Dan Cooper, a fictional version of events from the hijacking. It is a great book. He is a great author and he is joining me. And today he's a wordsmith and we're going to discuss words today because words really matter. Cooper was a man of very few words, but we do have a sense of some of the words and some of the language that he did use. So that is what we're going to talk about today. So let us know how we sound. Go ahead and do that in the comments. Do we all sound fine? Uh, is everybody, is the volume fine? Jude, say hello. Hello. And I just wanted to start out just by a, a quick Cooper quote. Now, I'm not 100% sure where this is from, but you will be able to tell me if Cooper actually said this or not. What he did say apparently was, Please subscribe to the DB Cooper Sleuth YouTube channel. Uh, make sure that you click subscribe, hit the notification bell, and select all. Please make sure to leave your reviews on wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Apple, Spotify, Google, iTunes, wherever it may be. Just make sure to follow the channel for more updates and amazing DB Cooper content. Now, I think that might be Tosaw's book. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, that, that was definitely Tosaw's book. It, it could have been Last Master Outlaw by the Colbert guy, uh, something yeah. like that. So anyway, yeah, he, he he did say that though. Yes, we we are we are wearing our glasses. So looking good, you criminals. Thank you, Packer Jack. And I also want to send a shout out to uh, my friend Livy, who is in Saint Ives, England, in uh, the Cornwall area. Hello, dear. How are you? And hello. There's a wave from Jude to Olivia. So anyway, so uh, we're going to talk about these words, and really, what we're going to do is we're going to go in chronological order. I think that's the best way to do it is to go in chronological order of the things he said or what we think he said. And we don't really have. It's interesting. We've got some direct quotes. Uh, when you when you look at the 302s, they seem to have some direct quotes. Sometimes they just say that he said to do this and that. Um, so that's how we're going to do it. But we're going to go in chronological order. Um, really, and I've made an executive decision here with um, most of the stuff that we've got is from the 302s, okay? But the closest book that was written to the event and the author who had the most access to the actual people who were there is was Richard Tussaw, who was an FBI agent who retired and was also a lawyer and then wrote a book. And it is highly endorsed by all of the uh, people uh, from who we interviewed, all the witnesses. And Tussaw is interesting because I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to use his quotes as the real quotes because I have, through some verification, through Bill, uh, through Alice, through other people, there are little things in that book that are only in that book that have been verified to be true from these people who said, yes, I told him that all those years ago. And again, as I'll say a million times, I do believe Tussaw is accurate because this was only written in the early 80s. This would be like writing a book about something that happened in 2015 or 2014. The, all, the, all the principles are still alive. So if you misquote them, your book is going to be sunk. Right, Jude? Totally agree. And at CooperCon, it was myself, yourself, I believe, and Bill, and Bill Mitchell in particular was effusive on his praise for Agent Tussaw, as he calls him. Yes. Never. It's never... Richard Tussaud, it's Agent Tussaud, and he right. seems to, whilst forgetting a lot of interviews with the FBI, he seems to recall fondly his interactions with Tussaud, yep. which I thought was very interesting. And again, uh, Tussaud is also the one who, he acted as Brian Ingram's lawyer to get the money back. So the reason why Brian even has this money is thanks to Richard Tussaud. And all he asked for from Brian was for one of the 20s. <laughs> that was his legal fee was one of the 20s. So he did get one of the 20s. Um, so hopefully I can represent Brian some Brian one day in something rather innocuous and he can give me one of the 20s. That would be nice. <laughs> so, and yes, as uh, Mary John says, a lawyer most likely would have been careful not to misquote living people. Absolutely. That's just, and just any responsible um, person would be that way. So let's start out here. The first thing we've got on Cooper is Dennis Lindsay, who is the ticket agent, he has Cooper saying, can I get on your flight to Seattle? So nothing really to take from that, except that he knew where he was going. <laughs> he was going to Seattle. So he said, can I get on your flight to Seattle? It is a misnomer. It's a myth, as me and Mr. Cunningham discussed, that 
Cooper asked for uh, asked if it was a seven twenty seven, right? And he said, uh, "Is this a seven twenty seven? That is a Himmelsbachism that ended up in the Unsolved Mysteries episode." He did not ask that. He didn't need to ask for that because the flight schedules back then expressly said what kind of aircraft it was. Uh, then we have the next quote is Dennis Lenz asks him what his name was, and he famously says, "Jude." <laughs> Cooper, Dan Cooper, because he had a pleasant voice. Yes. Uh, you, you know, you, you you think this kind of blendy McNobody who's walking through Portland International Airport. Blendy McNobody. Well, time, time out, time out. A blendy McNobody. That's a great line. Blendy McNobody. You know, that's that that's who this that's who this guy was. And I think with the Cooper Dan Cooper introduction, I think it's a huge indicator of this man's age, because yeah. uh, when I again and asking bill about it who bill got his ticket right after cooper cooper was the second to last ticket sold for that flight where i asked bill back then if someone asked for your name what did you say it's william mitchell whereas a man of cooper's generation would have introduced himself as cooper first not dan cooper even though it's fakey mcfake name but i think it's kind of a a good indication that there was a big generational difference between Bill Mitchell and the hijacker. And also to reiterate that, it is my understanding, I was never in the military, I was never in the military, but it is my understanding from talking to military people, uh, one of our members who was a Marine uh, contacted me uh, today and said, hey, look, if you're gonna talk about Cooper, Dan Cooper, one of the things that we military men do is you always go by your last name. Uh, I'm sure we've got some military guys. I know that Brad Legg is military, active military, that they yep. use their last names, uh, obviously, more than their first names. And so whenever they're going to say their name, they will say their last name first and then that. But again, as Jude said, it also is generational. Men of men of that age would have, I know that Pat Boland often mentions that her father would say, you know, Boland, Pat, you know, or, or Rinaldi. Uh, Rinaldi, Bill Rinaldi, or whatever his name, whatever father's name was. Yeah, they would go first. So it is an indication of age, and but it's also an indication possibly of military. And then Brad Legg says, yes, absolutely. They use the first names first, or the last names first, and then last. So but he does say Cooper, Dan Cooper, which again, also is a very bondish. If you want to go with that route, it is a very bondish thing to say, to say Cooper, Dan Cooper. Yeah, and I, I, I want to put on the, the, the side note, I love telling this story, and I will tell this at any given opportunity, and I, I've been dying to say it all day, I've been thinking about this one part, the comic book link of Dan Cooper, that there's a, a feeling or a discussion in the vortex that the hijacker picked his name for some philosophical or emotional reason, and at CooperCon, and again, you being the omnipresent person of CooperCon, it was myself, yourself, McNally, and I think Nikki Broughton sitting at the beer table and I had asked McNally, so why did you pick Robert Wilson for your name? And uh, I was expecting him to take this deep breath and say, well, let me take you back to 1953 and whatever. And this big long story. And he said, oh, because it was easy to remember and easy to spell. <laughs> and then right. more beer. And that was it. And I was like, yeah. what? Nothing deep at all about it. No, it's just easier I, I, I think, yeah, just again, Blandy McNobody, just uh, every name in the world, uh, because if I were, obviously I won't, because you have to put disclaimers out for it, just in case, but as an Irishman, if I was going to commit this crime, ironically, do you know what name I would give? Martin Michael McCollins. Collins. <laughs> Martin McNally. I think Michael Collins would be a bit too suspicious, but Martin McNally is just Dan Cooper. It's just Mr. Everybody. It's the it's it's one of the most common names here. McNally, is it really? Yeah. Okay. There's they're everywhere. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. M McNally's great. Um he, he he yeah, he was just it's easy to remember. Um, you know, I'm not completely uh Chris Cunningham got on my butt the other day because I said that I do think there might be a 10 to 15% chance that the name is taken from the comic. You know, I mean, it is kind of, it's pretty on the nose, really, for a, a skydiving crime. Um, it's it not, is. I mean, it's you not quite like that. using Tony Hawk because that's on a skateboarding crime because that is a not common name, Tony Hawk, but whereas Dan Cooper is. But uh, Cunningham said, I think it's close to zero, but I, I'm not going to say that. I, I think there's possibility that, um, that he was being cute about it. Um, but 
not too certain. So, all right. So moving on, we've got Cooper Dan Cooper. Um, we have Flo asking, uh, he asked Flo, the first thing he says to Flo, obviously when Flo comes up to him and says, what do you, what do you would like to drink? Because Flo started her drink service as you do from the back. And Cooper says, bourbon and seven up. Now, he did not specify what brand, apparently, because I maybe they only had one type, one brand, perhaps. So bourbon and seven up. Then he offers to hands her a 20. And she says, do you have anything smaller than this? And he says, no, I'm sorry. Quote from him. Flo says, I'll have to come back later with the change because I don't have any change with me. Cooper says, that'll be all right. And this is going to begin a segment. Cooper says the words all right a good bit. I don't know if yep. that means anything, but he uses the phrase all right several times throughout the hijacking. Um, Another he, clue, though. Yeah, go ahead. And in, in that interaction, right? So we have got Blandy McNobody hijacker pay the flight fee, you know, the ticket fee, which was $20, including tax. And he paid, paid with it with one $20 note or bill, sorry. And then he gets on the flight and tries to pay for a $1 drink with another $20 bill. So what we've got, and again, it's a big, big clue. There's, and again, another discussion because everybody likes to paint the picture of their own Cooper, right? Where there's a big discussion about was Cooper blue collar? I don't know about you, but I do not think a blue collar guy is going to be flashing 20s like that. I mean, he had no ones, no fives. Yeah, he like he, had, he like this man seemingly had a bunch of twenties, and as we go further into the discussion, where this man seemed to not be short of some money before getting on the plane, and how he behaved when he got the ransom. Mm -hmm. But more to come. But I I, I don't know. I, I, Hal Williams doesn't actually give any quotes for Cooper. Did Hal Williams say that at, at the gate before he got on that he had a pleasant voice, or was that Dennis Lindsay? That was uh, li uh, he did not speak to Cooper at all. That was, that was, so oh. uh, Dennis Lindsay was the only one who said that that Cooper said anything. So he had a nice uh, voice. He had a pleasant voice, and I've always just wondered whatever that means. I don't know, I don't know what that means. And I, I do point people to the audio that we played of Skip Hall. I, I do like Skip Hall's. Skip Hall has a pleasant voice. I would say, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I he absolutely does. I could listen to the guy all day. Like if he was like the telemarketing person when you're on hold to a huge yeah. company, like if you need to get your car I'll, fixed I'll, I'll, and I'll your play a pleasant voiced Cooper suspect here for everybody. Because I'm not in contact with anybody from Texas. <laughs> you uh, give the impression that you wouldn't like to go to Texas at this point. Well, if I wanted to commit suicide, uh, I would probably go to Dallas, Texas. That is a nice. It is a. It is. It is a. It is a nice voice and an even better Dick Dastardly mustache. I have to say, <laughs> Dick Dastardly, you're on a roll tonight. It must be the Guinness, Jude. Must be your Guinness. Sancho Mai. Cheers. All right. So then, uh, okay. So we've got him saying uh, he thanks Flo. Uh, he so he's being polite. Listen, we've got him saying no. I'm sorry. I have nothing smaller than a twenty. That'll be all right. You can bring it back. And then thank you. I'm about to hijack your plane. But thank you, ma'am, for bringing back my change. Uh, so then next, what we have is when, so there's some discrepancy, but uh, in Tucson, he has Cooper looking back at Flo saying, I think you should look at that note. I think you should read that note when she famously, when he famously hands her the note and she doesn't do anything. Um, but in her 302, it just says that he kept looking at her and then she opened it. But uh, she goes and sits down next to Cooper and she looks at him. And she says, are you kidding? And what does he say, Jude? No, miss. This is for real. This is for real. Yes. So that's a rather uh, intimidating thing to say. Maybe this is for real. I don't know. Not like, so it's, uh, intimidating. It, it's uh, and again, like even on the, on the note, like we've got uh, the only other known for definite example of Cooper's communication like in the note now we're, there's one definite in the wording of it is the word miss is that miss was in block capitals and it's i have a bomb in my briefcase please sit beside me i want you to sit by me whatever he wanted he wanted someone beside him but the word miss and he that is another word that he uses repeatedly 
Miss. To multiple oh, yeah. people. Miss. So what if his so what if his flight attendant had been Kenny Christensen? Uh, he's going to hand her a note that says Miss. So he'd already he, he was assuming <laughs> the gender. He was assuming the gender of the flight attendant when he wrote Miss already. He already had it re, re, Again? rewritten. Generational and I, I, Kenny Christensen. We also have Catalano. <laughs> so yeah. male flight attendants were not unusual. No, 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 absolutely not. They had them for sure. And so he was assuming the gender of whomever was going to be the flight attendant uh, that day. So he says, no, ma'am, this is for real. And then he, he, uh, we have uh, Flo when he keeps asking Flo, apparently she asked actually a second time even. Uh, she said, she asked him a second time if he was kidding. And he says, no, miss. So there's that word again, no, miss. I'm not being, not kidding. Then he, and he tells her when he shows her the bomb, he says, all I have to do is attach this wire to this gadget here and we'll all be dead, which he must have said something very similar to Tina later on, because Tina indicates that he made it very clear to her that they were in mortal danger. So he must have said something I, very similar. I totally buy it. I, I mean, I I totally buy it where as a hijacker, like it's the same with anybody that's going up to a teller with a gun on their face. You know, basically, I... I mean business. Yeah. I mean business. And that's what he was doing. He he was intimidating them into submission and not to scream, probably. Where he was probably saying, right, I need to tell them that this is a bomb. And if they don't do what I say, then I will put the wire into the blasting cap and we're all gone. So that was to kind of urge that compliance quickly, which, I mean, talking about how, how well planned this was, where, I mean, it's a good tactic if you want to get control of the situation, terrify them beyond belief and show them the bomb. That's completely intentional. It's, yeah. well, obviously, you know, for, for his plan, it was well, a key What's interesting part of it. is that none of the, we have a lot of other hijackers who, who never, oh, Cooper just fell. Little, little Coop. Oh, no. Little Coop oh, get him back. He's okay. He broke his ankle. Uh, but he, the other uh, guys, a lot of times, they never showed their their bomb. Um, they would just say, "I have a bomb in this bag here," and they just took their word for it. But Cooper went the extra step and built a pretty convincing fake, which has me thinking maybe it wasn't a fake because he went to the effort to make. He didn't need to go to that effort, but he did did anyway. So I, you know, with, with respect to Darren Schaefer's latest Mike Vining, who is a very highly respected Delta Force operator, um, I. I still think it's possibly real. So, I certainly think it's real too. Like a quick note on the bomb before we go. Yeah. I mean, this was an erratic individual who was planning to leap out of the back of the plane with a bag of money and a parachute. I mean, saying that leaving an exposed wire is just totally unsafe. Cooper didn't give the shiniest piece of fecal matter what was safe and what wasn't. This man did not care if he was going to live or die or take anyone with him. I don't believe. Where, like, what's he going to do? Adhere to safety regulations in the Demolitions Act, USA, 1962? Absolutely not. He's going to have an exposed wire. Like, this is a this is a live wire of a person. You know, people that aren't very safety conscious don't decide to hijack a plane for a night jump. They don't do that. So I I, I do not think, you know, not adhering to safety precautions is in any way an indication that the bomb was fake, if anything, quite the opposite. No, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, and so, and, and interestingly, that's, we'll just jump ahead to when he talks to Tina and tells Tina, I'm not going to be taken alive. So, he, repeatedly, apparently, according to Tina, repeatedly, he said, I won't be taken alive. So, that could just be a bluff, but I, I don't know. So, don't next, we've got Flo uh, asking Cooper, what do you want me to do? And he goes, well, take this down. And she fishes out a pen from her bag. She uses the envelope to write. She actually writes on the envelope that was the, the letter that the, the uh, bomb letter, Miss I have a bomb sitting next to me, was, was actually inside of an envelope. And so she used the envelope to write down. He, she, he says, take this down. And he wrote down, I want $200,000 by, by 5 p.m. in cash. Put it in a knapsack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. 
no funny stuff or I'll do the job. So there's, there's a our... lot to digest in there because a CooperCon and the, of course, the love I have for Special Agent Larry Carr knows absolutely no bounds. But one of the bases that the FBI had used to kind of determine that the Cooper was a complete waffle, waffle being an inexperienced or non experienced skydiver is that skydiving is full of lingo. And I mean, I'm still learning it a long time after starting it later. But he didn't use the main, the, what a skydiver would say to a fellow skydiver is I want two primaries and two reserves at that time. But what Cooper was doing was explaining it to a frightened young woman who knew nothing about skydiving, who'd just seen a bomb. He's going to keep his language very simple to avoid confusion over his demands because he needs to get, articulate them as clearly as possible for a complete and utter no knowledge you know, about skydiving to, to the stewardess. And, and again, I don't buy the him using that language as him being in any way inexperienced because he was explaining it to somebody who knew nothing about parachutes, unless it was Sharon Weathersby, who was Max hostage stewardess, who was a skydiver and wingsuiter and AFF instructor, I think, as well. Like, what the hell? What well, are the odds? I would, I will point out to people that uh, Alice Hancock was also had gone skydiving before. So, yes, because and there were no tandem jump Hancock, and there and there were no tandem jumps back then. So Alice no. Hancock, by herself, jumped out of a plane before, uh, before before she ran into Cooper. So I think that's interesting. That's something there to to consider there. So next uh, we've got, let's see. After okay, and she says after writing this down, she looked at Cooper. This is Flo, and he calmly said, "No fuss." Now, I wish I could find the video that I've got. I have a video somewhere of Anderson. Anderson thought, Anderson said in an interview that, that he thought the words were no fuzz, which fuzz obviously is, it was a, is, was a term for police. And that would, that would make sense in that context to say no fuzz instead of no fuss. So I don't know which one it was, perhaps no fuss, no fuzz. Remember, the no fuss comes from the 302, which is a secondhand writing of an agent. He, the agent may have misunderstood fuzz for fuss and wrote down fuss. I'd imagine he'd say fuss because really with that request for no fuss, it was adhered to where the passengers didn't know anything, where don't cause a fuss, you know, don't run to the cockpit, don't scream don't you know no fuss you know i can imagine i can totally imagine him saying it as and be careful you know no fuss don't let anybody around us know where I, I i have heard the no fuss no fuzz discussion before but i think no fuss especially at that crucial stage because all she had to do was scream and the whole thing was fucked yeah and that was it <laughs> the the whole plan was kaput and it was over yeah, yeah, no fuss could man. Yeah, I don't know. And so then it's interesting, Cooper. This seems rather ominous to me that the way he says this, but maybe it's maybe again, it's context. We're reading it instead of hearing it. But after he says no fuss, Cooper says, "quote After this, we'll take a little trip." So I, that sounds kind of ominous, maybe if you read it that way. Uh, and then. Flo says, okay. And she goes, do you want me to take this to the cockpit? And here's this, here's this word again. Cooper says, all right, go ahead. So there's our all right again. So either no fuss, no fuzz. I don't know. But then he says, okay, all right, go ahead. Then Tina sits down next to Flo. And Cooper says to, he reiterates to Tina after showing her the bomb. He says, no kidding and no funny stuff. So we have the line again, no funny stuff. He'd like to use this word funny. You know, no, and then again, we have Tina a separate time saying he reiterated that the crew should attempt nothing funny. So take that. Yeah. I don't, that's not a word that I would probably use. That seems to be a dated no. term. Very dated. I mean, so what, what we've got from, you know, the, from buying the ticket up to now, like, I mean, we're just airborne in this hijack and we've just taken off. And he said some really funny, antiquated stuff. There's the word funny again, where even, even the, the language choices that he uses, which, I mean, from the immediate 302s and subsequent 
interviews that, you know, these words have remained. Mm -hmm. They just remain and they're repeated that it, it's just so odd. Like, and I would imagine that influenced their aging of the hijacker because anyone would know when they're speaking to a contemporary big, and I'll give you a funny example for the channel, right? I was actually catfished on a date once and this lady was definitely in her late fifties and I'm 33 and her language choices were so odd and why I thought about DB Cooper whilst being catfished in this restaurant, <laughs> I, I will never know, but it was totally, totally true where I got it, where I was thinking as a 33 year old, right? This lady was deep into her fifties because of her language choices and the way she carried herself. And that's mm -hmm. what helped me age the catfish and what probably helped the stewardesses age the hijacker too. Well, so I'll add here this, I'll, I'll bring this up that one of the, one of the copycat attempts when I was doing my copycat book stuff that I came across an article during one of the copycat attempts where the passengers are talking about how the hijacker was speaking. And they say here, I'll put it up. A lot of their remarks sounded like they were coming out of a TV set. So <laughs> yeah. you know, that is interesting that they were basically using tough guy language that they had gotten from TV. You know, no funny stuff or I'll do the job. No, don't do anything funny. Don't try nothing funny. You know, that could be Cooper pretending to be a tough guy or just using tough guy language that he learned on TV or, you know, as he wasn't screaming at them and it wasn't the, the typical bank robbery. Um, he wasn't cussing at him, I guess. You know, wasn't dropping the MF bombs on him and stuff like McNally was. M Marty, bless his heart. We love Mac, but Mac was cursing at people and scaring the hell out of him. And McCoy, McCoy was yes, absolutely was. scaring the shit out of people during his, yes, during his hijacking. He was, and as people yeah. often talk about that, that really almost shows um, unease with the situation uh, when you're really intimidating people and scaring people, you, it's, it's a reflection of your, your fear yourself. You're, you're nervous and scared yourself. So Cooper's really, it just goes back to how calm he was. He's really, you know, we have Tina saying he's laughing. I mean, several times Cooper's laughing when he's responding to her and that's interesting. Um, so let's see, nothing funny. So then, he insisted to Tina that she must be physically present alongside him at all times. Quote, I want you to sit here and relay messages on the interphone. You tell them everything I say and don't try anything funny. So interestingly enough, this is the point in Tussauds book where he mentions that Tina thought it was interesting that he used the term interphone. So that is... Uh, absolutely. That That's some somewhat... I would not know what the what the telephones called on a plane. I would just call it the phone. I wouldn't know to call it the because with no for some 727 nerdery. So the the aft phone was the interphone, which could only phone the cockpit. And the front phone was a telephone which could call the tower in the event there was radio failure or the cockpit was locked shut from the inside and the radio wasn't reachable by any of the flight crew in the cabin. So I thought that's a fun little tidbit just there. Mm -hmm. But this hijacker knew the difference where he knew the difference in the phones because let's say he sat at the front, like, you know, with the cockpit phone, yeah. it would have been interesting. And it does speak somewhat to the choice of seat because if you think about it, like the front, the very front seat, say he sat in one E instead of 18 E, sure. it's the same idea where with the interphone, it meant that he can communicate with the cockpit silently and not shouting through a door. So that to me was something that he picked that seat because with that interphone, interestingly, was right behind Cooper's ear. It was right, literally right behind him, yeah. just beside the little bathroom door. It was just on that mounted wall right beside them because Tina I said on her three, she was able to reach around from a seated position, reach the interphone and speak well, on it. Uh, I do have to correct you there. You're going to be, you're going to be corrected by the Cooper sleuth. I hate, hate to do it. No. So, yeah. When, when she's saying that she was able to pick up the phone and talk, that's actually while Flo was sitting in next to Cooper. So she was sitting, oh. she's saying that's when she called the cockpit. 
So because it's actually oh, okay. on, yeah, it's on the, it's, uh, the phone is on the port side wall next. To oh, it's the, on the uh, other one. Yeah. It's next to the, uh, it's next to the lever where you lower the upstairs. So yeah, it's oh, on the other. Okay. So, yeah. But the way I read weird. that 302 was, yeah, I thought, it. thought that Tina was able. Yeah. To I mean, she says that. She it. says that. Well, she's referring the phone to sitting right? down. Cause see, Flo and Tina were sitting next to each other on the, uh, mm. the bulkhead door that closed. They were able to sit there together and there was like a jump seat for two people. So Tina is sitting there while she's watching while Flo gets up and 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 is sitting next to Cooper. So yeah. So there's an, an interesting comment here. Uh oh, it's from Nikki. Is Nikki finding DB Cooper? Is that it's labeled interphone in the 727 manual? Okay. It's labeled yeah. interphone, but the word interphone, I believe, goes back to the 1930s. When it was even with radios on larger aircraft for cargo and stuff like that, it, it, it's, it was an old word even by 1971 that interphone, as in there was a way for the rear cabin to be able to contact the now, cockpit we, without the use of the out radio. I researched it, and interphone was used um, in, by air crew in World War II. So that was how they would communicate. They used the term interphone. I'm, I'm going to pull up on the screen this photograph here. This is a photograph up there in the sled test of the Cooper plane. You can see how on that door there, there's that door. It's got two seat belts. That's for the two stewardesses. That's it, that's a jump seat. It folds down. And so that is where Tina was sitting. And she's able to, that guy in that awesome 70s jacket there is blocking where the phone is. But you can see there. But yeah, that's that's the jump seat where Tina and Flo were sitting when Cooper turns around. and you know, this guy here on the left, he's standing where the seats, they actually removed the, they removed the seats there. So you can see here, there's the Cooper seats. That row was removed temporarily for the sled test from when they used, from when they did the sled test. So that's actually the origin of the misnomer. There were some people who thought that the Cooper row of seats was removed and was put somewhere for evidence, but that's not true. They removed it just for the sled test and then put it back. I'm sure notoriously cheap Donald Nyrop would have been, no, we're not sacrificing a row of seats for this. No, we're, the seats no, we're keeping them. Yeah. yeah, which is interesting, though, because they actually did remove the seats in the McCoy hijacking. They did remove his row of seats uh, for evidence. So anyway, so we don't we have the don't try anything funny. Then he tells Tina that the bomb was electrically fused and he hoped that the crew would not generate any electrical currents that would trigger it. He says, I don't think the radio transmissions will bother it much, but I just wanted to let the crew know. So this is that weird radio communications and everybody who, who deals with bombs says that, you know, yes, you there are radio communications could screw with some stuff, but it would have to be an enormous amount of frequency shot right at something to do that. But I would say the fact that Cooper even knew that was a possibility speaks to something. I would not know that theoretically a radio could set off a bomb, but. Oh, yeah, a radio controlled bomb? Oh, for sure. I mean, the IRA used those for decades. And I think that fear in Cooper was somehow confounded because, let's face it, this guy knew that they would put out their emergency distress call squawk, which does use a stronger frequency. <laughs> yeah. Where I think that that line was perhaps a ploy to try and get them not to squawk out to McCord to get the F-106s on them right away. That's just, what I think. He's just trying to, well, I would just say, yeah, I would agree with that somewhat. I would just say he's, he's trying to limit communications with, with the ground, just trying to keep everything no fuss really you know that's kind of what it's he's worth a try. It's, it's it's worth a try if he doesn't try it then you know why 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 not but obviously they did the, 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 the you know the distress calls went out right away next we have the money discussion and cooper uses the phrase to tina i'm rolling with what tina says here not what negotiable american currency they don't buy that uh Coop, tina has cooper saying he wanted the money he wanted circulated us currency which is, again that's still a weird phrase to say U.S. currency. Now, that's a strange, I don't know what to think of that. You know, we, we've got the, all of the things, that, all of the terminology that we have. We have, the, we have Bill Ratajk telling 
in real time, we have the real time transcript of the radio communications. Bill Ratajkowski says that the hijacker wants two hundred thousand dollars in negotiable American currency, and then we have Tina saying circulated U.S. currency. It's interesting. It, it, we've got two different people saying he used the term currency. That's a weird. I, I would not say that. You just say I want two hundred thousand dollars. A part of me buys this circulated currency thing because let's say the whether it was the airline or the fbi right i know it was the airline that went for it what if they'd got the two hundred thousand dollars from vegas because the casino money isn't circulated and it's too hot you know that money where it's accounted for where basically what i took that was as as i want this money from the bank i don't want it from vegas i don't want it from an fbi rat who has access to hundreds of thousands of dollars at a moment's notice it's i want circulated money from the bank right that's what i think we, well we also have him we have elsewhere someone using the term he wanted used bills that's in that's in somebody's 302 that he wanted used used money and it could be as uncle jim says here this is a possibility too um i'll put it up here uncle jim too says that says that uh cooper where'd it go says that uh, it could have been just trying to make a distinction between Mexican pesos or Cuban money, whatever, you know, just because of all the hijackings back then that were going overseas, maybe he just wanted to distinguish that. So there's that. But it, it, even if it was, if he was given Canadian because with the exchange rate in 1971, I think there was something with Nixon had devalued gold or there was something about Nixon and gold or whatever it was, but the yeah. Canadian dollar and the American dollar in 1971, if Cooper had been given 200,000 Canadian, it would have been probably just around the same. Well, and so, but, but again, I, I mean, what bank is going to have that much money in Canadian currency anyway? Or I mean, I mean, I guess a, maybe, no maybe C first corporate office would have had that much money, and I, I doubt it though. But yeah, Mary Johns here says circulated sounds more reasonable, just to say that's that's brand instead of, just so it's not brand new sequenced cash because you're just you would think that marked money would be more likely to be brand new. That's sitting and that maybe they could mark it easier as brand if it's brand new. And I, I get that circulated gives the, gives the idea that he wanted it from cash registers and things like that. You know, just to, it, it makes it more likely that it's not going to be microfiched uh, serial numbers sourced, I would say. Uh, then at some point during around this time, when Tina first starts sitting next to Cooper, Alice, uh, and this is true, we have verified this. This is Tussaw, and we have also verified it from Alice herself. Uh, she goes back there to try to jump on the grenade, as we say, for, for Tina, because Alice was the senior flight attendant and she invented a reason she wanted Tina. She goes back there and she tells Tina, hey, there are some people in first class who were looking for playing cards. Will you find some playing cards and take them up to first class? The implication being that she wanted Tina to stand up and move away and that she would sit next to Cooper herself. And Cooper sees through this ruse, ruse, and Cooper says, forget the cards, miss, go back to your station. There's this word miss again. So he says, yeah. miss, go back to your station. So go back up to first class, which is where Alice was. So that's Alice was in charge of first class. And so she goes back there and forget the cards, miss, go back to your station. So then we have, we have this thing where Tina and Cooper start chatting. And at some point during this time, go ahead, Jude. Can I go back to something? Yes. Because this is a, I think there's nothing in the, in the vault about it that I've ever seen. But I, this is a line that Cooper said that I want to be true. And I, I don't disbelieve it. And it's from Tusa as well, where the, the ruse of the, this time, oh, I don't want this to detonate anything where they started moving the passengers rows up and Bill Mitchell had refused to leave. He said, no, right. I'm comfortable. I've a row to myself. And allegedly Cooper said he needs to leave or words to that effect, or he needs to get out of here or something whatever. like it was something. Yes. I wish I had that. Yeah. I forgot that quote. That's a good one. Yeah. He tells Tina that, that I, one. I was there. just noticing it on, on the sheet. He has to leave or something about that sure. because I know Bill was, not as rattled the right word. I don't know if Bill's watching this. 
chime in with the right word, but it was like he actually referred to me. He noticed me too. But he was suddenly, he's right, right there. And I, I would say the same I, to my hostage. I would say he needs to leave. Yeah. And Bill refused, and he actually. Um, all yeah, the other passengers yeah. moved up, and Bill said that he had his books. He was studying. He was a studious fella. He was a, Bill's a smart guy. Bill became an engineer for Boeing, yeah. interestingly enough. So he was an engineering student, and he had his books out studying, being studious, maximizing his 30-minute flight, which I like that. He's a good kid. But he didn't want to move. He saw no reason to move up, and it was not until Alice – came back to him at some point and begged him to move up. And he finally did. He said, fine, I'll move up. And that was right around the time when they landed there. Yeah. I'll try to find the, but I completely buy that. I, I would, uh, 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 one of the few things now that is, isn't in three Oh twos Cooper having a revolver and his trench coat, I would take that to the bank. I would also take that line to the bank. He is sitting about four and a half feet from this guy. And I would well believe that the hijacker said he needs to leave, get him out of here, or words to that effect. Right. The Okay. This is the quote that he's got, that Tussaw has from Tina, that it says that he especially pointed to Mitchell and said, get the one across the aisle out of there. So get the one across the aisle out of there. So now, okay. So we've totally got this. Then Tina starts talking to Cooper and during their small talk, uh, Tina asks Cooper where he's from and he uses the phrase, knock it off. So, cause she tells him, this is the whole interaction where she tells Cooper where she's living. And she says, Minneapolis. And Cooper uses the term nice country, which is a Americanism that it's funny. I do see online people will, I guess they're from different countries. Uh, maybe even maybe Jude is not used to that terminology. That, no, no. And so it's, it's very like, French because people are like, did Cooper not? Know what, there, there's people who say, did, did Cooper think that Minnesota was a, a its own country or something? And, and it's like, no, no, no. It's a. It's a derivation of countryside. Anybody in America knows that we, when you're saying, oh, that's nice land, that's some pretty land there, we use the term country. So it's just yeah, nice but land. But that is an old timey. It's an, it's, I mean, I would not say that. I it, doesn't say that. it doesn't translate well where, uh, I mean, my my nearest neighbor is, is France. France is, what, 90 minutes that way in the air, where in French, Bon Provence means lovely part of the world. Where it's a, 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 it's 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 not literal as in lovely country, but it is also in usage in uh, Quebec French as well. Where if you're in a rural Canadian village and say, "Oh, bon Provence," you know, this is a lovely part of the world. Where that's, I think, what to me was a bit of a, oh, it's it's just it's antiquated for an English speaking American, but it's very prevalent for somebody that English isn't their first language because um uh even in spanish ah pace bonita you know lovely part of the world you know it's just uh, yeah, the, nikki as a european that's the way i read it nikki points out the phrase no country for old men the uh the movie title no country for old men is referring to this area this is not a good area this land here or whatever so that's so he says, says so he says minnesota's nice country which people have implied that cooper had some familiarity with Minnesota. And I've been in Minnesota. It is nice country. It's the land of a thousand lakes, they say. It's really pretty, yeah. except in the wintertime. I'm sure it's freezing cold, but I was there in the summertime and it was nice. So it was pleasant. And so then as they're talking, you know, Tina says, oh, well, it's interesting that Tina is playing detective in some way. She's she's asking him where, he, where he's from. And obviously there's only one reason. That's not just small talk. That's more than small talk. She's prying and she says, where are you from? Mm -hmm. And he goes, knock it off. And yeah, and it, yeah, and it, it, which is interesting. Here's something interesting. Yes, go ahead. Here, this, this is quite interesting. Now, this was not provided to stewardesses at all in uh, the, a situation where they were being held hostage. But in a lot of banks in the United States at that time, where what they wanted to for bank tellers is ask personal questions. Like even in the movies, like... Uh, the hostage negotiator or always asks, what is your name? Offering them a cigarette, you know, 
where are you from? Asking them personal questions where Tina, savvy young lady at that time. And I believe that while she could be trying to be nice to him, I think there was a sense of, I'm going to try and unnerve him. And she succeeded. I would say that she's, and we, as a defense attorney, um, dealing with criminal stuff, we use the term fishing. Uh, yeah. Cops will go fishing. And I think that's, she was that, That's a good word. She was. She was. And and that is, and even though the, she didn't really look at him to try and antagonize him, but, you know, with uh, a well-known tactic, and Chris Voss actually talks about this. He was a big FBI negotiator uh, for a long, long time. And how you, you try and get yourself to safety is try and build some form of a relationship with your captor. And how you do that is by asking them personal questions. I, See, like the fly on a wall conversation that I would love to have been to. I mean, it's up there with like the Last Supper, Potsdam. This conversation, I would have loved to have heard. Yeah. And everybody uh, would have been here. Packer, uh, Packer, uh, John Limbach, the author of the great book, Where Was Skip? Everyone Should Read. Uh, he just yeah. sent something. He just sent some, something to me, and I'll put it up here. So he sent from the Boeing 727 manual. Uh, they actually, here we have, they actually use the term station. So the actual official terminology for where a stewardess is supposed to be is called a station. So if Cooper used that actually did use the term station, that's indicative of something as well. That's a familiarity with airline ish type stuff. Whereas I, I try to, I, you always try to imagine yourself in a situation. I would just say, go back up to the front or just, you know, beat it or yeah. whatever, you know, just go, go back to where you came from is what I would probably say. Miss, go back to where you came from. Oh, go away. But he used but the that, term Yeah, station, that word station. Not the word station though. So they use the word stewardess mm. stations was the actual, mm. actual terminology at the time period, which is interesting. Mm. So, but uh, even with, uh, with, you know, miss, you know, the, the whole miss thing, like even with, with Alice Hancock at the time, who absolutely was married to Jim Hancock, the rock star 727 skydiving pilot, is that Cooper, to me, is a man who spent that hijacking communicating in the company of unmarried women. And the FBI did profile the man as Catholic, where, I mean, I'm in Catholicville of planet Earth. And, you know, the miss thing, yes, I know it's it's genial, good manners, but, I mean, he is from an ilk and a bygone era of the symbol, not even asking for their names. Because right. you just, you didn't, you didn't do that at his age. It was just, it was miss. And if they gave you your name, their name, they accepted. But Northwest Orient stewardesses didn't wear name tags, but Pan Am and Delta did. Interesting. Which is, yeah. it's, it's very strange because oh, he would have called them their names. Now, with the other uh, hijackings, like American, there was American, there was Delta, there was uh, other airlines that were hijacked by the copycats. Yeah. They're, they wore name badges. Yeah. But Northwest Orient didn't. Again, why was that? They cost money. Enamel name badges, they weren't <laughs> cheap. <laughs> well, so none of their air crews wore name badges. But Nikki until says, the late 70s. Now, yeah, when well, Nikki says they had name, that they did have name tags, but I've, I've not seen. The photos that I've got, I mean, I actually have a photograph. I'll, I'll try to find it. I actually have a photograph of Flo. Yeah, there was, there was a, a Northwest Orient stewardess at CooperCon who sat behind us. And somebody asked that question, did you wear name tags? And I can't remember her name. She is in the group, but she said no. Not then. Not in 71. They didn't. Mm -hmm. Maybe later, but certainly not in 71 because in the press conference mm. and... They they were not wearing name tags. At that well, time, I, that I, saw. I, I well here is some real time uh, real time debunking there, Jude. Let me see if let me see. Yes, I I, I can't tell here. I'm about to show the group. I'll, I'll get the groups. Uh, this is a good pod, as we say, good pod for the podcast listeners. But this is not good pod hmm. for you guys. But we're gonna no. we're gonna try this out. Uh, I'm gonna see if I'm gonna see if uh, everyone in the audience who's watching this what they think about this. Let's see. So here's a favorite photograph that I actually uh, I actually have this photograph of Flo. I, I zoomed in on it that I scanned. Uh, this is her holding a coffee, looks like, being interviewed by uh, 
Earl Milne, the the guy, uh, the FBI agent. And that looks like a name tag, actually, that you can see that horizontal line there underneath, because that, that thing above there, that little wing thing, that's the Northwest Orient. They had these, they had these name tag, or they had these not name tags, but they had these little like pins that uh, I'll, I'll see if I can pull one up here. Yes. Hold up. You said it's a debunk. What's that? No. You said it was a debunk. I have a counter. Okay. So the top line is a breast pocket. The bottom one is a snip for a watch. Do you ever see like nerd like tunics where they can attach watches or pens or certain items? Because if you look at her wrist, she has no watch on it. Stewardesses weren't allowed to wear anything on their not wrists. True, so, not true. Not true. Not true. Tina, Tina, Are you sure? Tina's wearing a watch the whole time. You know, we have the photographs of her coming off the plane. She has, she's wearing like a watch bracelet sort of thing. So, um, no, that's not true. I, I can't. That could be a pocket. It could be. It could be the top of a pocket. I'd have to look at the the Northwest Orient uniforms. I'd have to let's it's uh let's do this real quick. Let's pull up. Let's let's take this out. Here's good pod people, but everybody's with us here. Let's see. Thirty six hours after the skyjacking, the flight crew faces the press, giving reporters and the nation a first hand account of their experience. He was not nervous. He seemed rather nice, and other than he wanted certain things to be done. He never tried to harm myself, and although he was impatient a few times, he was never cruel or nasty or um, impolite to me in any way. But I, I think that was a name tag. So it's interesting know. he still called them mess, though. Well, I mean, that's so, just polite. I, them. Somebody... That. I mean, I would say that. I would say, okay, here we go. Okay, here's the photograph that is gonna, yeah. All right, this is this is uh, this is the one ring to rule them all, as they say. Let me pull this photograph up here of Tina. Yep, yep, yep. Here we go. Okay, I'm about to load this up for everybody. This is good pod, as we say. Sorry for everybody who's in the pod. I'll, maybe I can edit that. But let's see. Here's the photograph of Tina from the press conference. That's a name tag. So debunk. That's definitely a name tag. So they had name tags, but regardless, I don't think it matters much. I mean, I would call, I don't care. I, even if I know somebody's name, I'm still going to call them ma'am or miss. Just me. Yeah. That's just Southerners have manners and that's definitely how it is. But regardless, mo moving forward, let's see. Uh, bah, bah, bah. So as they're talking, Tina is, Tina tells Cooper, hey, you know, if we're going to Cuba, she starts just shooting the crap with him. She goes, if we're going to Cuba, we have to remind the passengers that they can't buy cigars or rum because it'll get confiscated at customs. And Cooper laughs. Here's Cooper laughing again. Cooper says, quote, we're not going to Cuba in one Havana is another in another 302. It says Havana, but we're not going to Cuba, but we're going to a, quote, pleasant place. So the word pleasant. That pleasant. again, very antiquated. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Pleasant is not a word I use. I would use in my vocabulary much today for sure. No. Pleasant, no. very, know. very, very old, very, just very bizarre. And at this point uh, of of the hijacking, she's sitting beside him. Let's say what about half an hour? At this point, she's sitting beside him about half an hour. And this is where the McCoy people, the you know the the rack straw people, where this stewardess was not speaking to a contemporary like she would know at this point i'm speaking to someone around my age where she was sitting sat beside somebody her father's age who was at least twice her age if not more i would i would err on the side of more it's just he doesn't say an awful lot of words but the words he uses say a hell of a lot about him so we we have a guy who is using very antiquated language and very antiquated social norms at that time. Like we have the 1960s, you know, free love and stuff like that, where formality was starting to die out by the start of the 60s. But he very much kept it on. And he was probably one of these guys that was kind of like the way I am now. It's like, stop the world. I want to get off. 
Mm. You know, the world's a scary place. That's probably the way he was in 71. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Yeah, so pleasant is an interesting... Pleasant's definitely an interesting uh, terminology there. Uh, but so, th- and, and almost, it's funny because him saying we're going to take a little trip somewhere, pleasant place. It, it, if you if you read that a certain way, that sounds sinister. Do you agree? <laughs> you, you, you know what? I don't. I think this is the way this man spoke. Where it, uh, I can understand why uh, she would find it sinister, and we would find it sinister. But somebody could be watching this, and let's say there's young people watching this, which I strongly doubt. I mean, young people are doing interesting things on a Saturday night, uh, like you know, drinking and you know, trying to find mates and so on uh, where they're not talking about db cooper but th- people could find the language that we use today sinister in 25 years or I-, I i think this is just how he spoke i i i could see how it could come across as sinister and right. weird and creepy and just ugh. but so uh, yes it is sinister but i don't know if cooper's trying intentionally to be menacing now, again because see that i mean the there's people no that the, there's no Correct. tone in text. There's no tone in text. No. So we don't know. Because because see the, the, the copycats that did the whole I kill all you motherfuckers act mm-hmm. and wanted to be sinister. Oh, they were. They they made their presence known. They made their weapons known. <laughs> and they made yeah. their, if you cross me, bad things will happen. And this man just didn't. Cooper just did not. Here's another picture uh, sent, to me, sent to me by Nicole Legg. There's a photograph of uh stewardess outfit and they, yeah their name tags were gold so they did have a little gold name tag but that's regardless so next we've got thank you for that nicole uh next we've got the famous it's not because i have a grudge against your airlines miss it's just because i have a grudge this flight suited well we don't know what exactly he says he says the flight suited his time place and plans so but of course it did that's we've always discussed how this grudge line, I do think there's been too much emphasis put on that. I think that every who's a criminal could blame some. As a criminal defense attorney and as a former prosecutor, I've dealt with well over a thousand criminals personally, and they've always got an excuse. It's somebody else's fault. Yeah, they're greedy. They want money. Yeah. They want, they, 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 they want money. Like, I mean, if, if D.B. Cooper wasn't financially motivated he would have got onto the flight and asked for a mickey mantle baseball card and four parachutes i mean he wouldn't like he he was a greedy mf that's what he wanted money money was his thing his grudge was i don't have enough money see if he asked for a mickey mantle baseball card his grudge would have been i don't have a mickey mantle baseball card yeah it's as simple as that it's like i was listening um the lady that was on Jude, uh, not, uh, the, lady, the lady that was on Darren's most recent podcast, um, it's a pseudonym, it's not a real name, but the, the, I forget that whatever the name was, Jennifer Washburn or something. Um, the She talks about how she thinks that Cooper just got the money and burned it and it wasn't about the money or something. And I will respond to that and say, please, please, please show me any bank robbery in history where the bank robber wanted to rob a bank just to burn the money. Like this is, Okay, this is not the Joker in the Dark Knight. Like, I mean, this this is no. real, real life. I, I, you will never find a bank robber who commits a bank robbery not for the money. So th- this is ridiculous. I mean, that's and six thousand wow. Tina Barr. So so he burnt one hundred ninety four thousand and buried six. I haven't listened to this yet, but no, uh, that's uh, a, I, 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 that, the Cooper's motive was clearly money, but the grudge line. That's, that's what he that's what he asked for. Be, because with Cini, Cini. No, uh, he had wanted a release of a prisoner. Was it? Is there something? Was there? Was there other? No, uh, no. So, okay, so no, that didn't so involve. Cini w- was pretending to be an IRA. He was trying to throw the scent off of who he really was by claiming to be a member of the IRA, and he wanted yeah. hostage. He said, "I'm doing this because of I want hostages released or something like this." So. He was trying to divert attention by making a false motive, I guess. He was trying to make people he think wanted it wasn't a, him. An, int- an interesting local connection, as a side note before we move on, is that Sini and one of his demands, I believe, had wanted safe passage to Northern Ireland. 
Yeah, well, that's that's what I'm saying is that that was part of his. He was planning to jump out right of somewhere over Saskatchewan yep. or somewhere, but he, that was part of his gimmick was he was pretending to be a member of the IRA, hoping to muddy the waters. And hey, look, you know what? Guess what? If if Cooper had said that, we 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 we'd be focusing on people who have connections to the IRA. So maybe that's not the I'd worst idea. I'd be a suspect because I love here. Because I love here. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it would be that's not that's not the worst thing for a, a, a criminal to do to, to do this. So as we move on, uh, Cooper did ask if she smoked. He said, do you smoke when they're discussing cigarette smoking? And she says that she quit and he peer pressures her into taking a cigarette anyway. So that's one of those cute things is Cooper. We have eight cigarettes recovered and uh, it would be it would be our luck if they ever found one of the cigarettes and it was Tina's cigarette. They ran the DNA. We finally found Cooper's. We, we got Cooper's cigarette. They did plot twist. They didn't destroy the cigarettes. They kept one for preservation purposes. And we test the DNA on it. And by God, it's Tina Mucklow's cigarette. That would be the ultimate vortex moment. Uh, that would be a nightmare. So then we have the interaction with the 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 cowboy, which is uh, name is uh, Robert Cummings, a very stern looking individual. Uh, after he, after this whole encounter, Cooper leans over and says, if that is a sky marshal, I don't want any more of that. And the, uh, Alice says that Cooper <laughs> multiple times wanted reassurances on several occasions that there were no air marshals on the plane. So he, which is interesting because there's only 30 something people uh, there. And I were air tell, marshals a thing in domestic flights in the U.S.? And they were. Uh, they started the air marshal program in 1964. And so there were air marshals. And what's interesting is I talked to, yeah, uh, was it today, Saturday? Yeah, yesterday. So yesterday, I'll tell a little story. I was in federal court on a case and I was doing a, a I can't, obviously I can't say what it was, but I was doing something at federal court with a client and the room had three FBI agents. We just lost. Still Judy, here. You're still nope, there. I'm still here. I'm just re I'm recalibrating the camera. Sorry. Go ahead. Because uh, it's dark in here. So I'm readjusting the light. Okay. That's fine. So I was in a room full of F two, three FBI agents. I had uh, two DEA agents and I had a guy who used to be, well, one of the DEA agents, one of the, uh, oh yeah. And then it was an ATF guy, DEA, FBI, and ATF. So this was a pretty heavy case people I was working on. My, my client's not, He's in trouble for sure. So anyway, the ATF guy, one of the people there, one of the U.S. attorneys that was there said, hey, I, I've seen you on your you do the D.B. Cooper stuff. And I said, yeah, I do. And of course, the FBI guys in the office and the DA guys there, they, they sit up, and go, oh, Cooper. And everyone knows Cooper. They go, oh, Cooper. So I start regaling them. My client had not been brought over by the U.S. Marshals yet to the office. And the the uh the uh yes the guy one of the atf agents says that he used to be an air marshal and he starts talking about 727s and he says that one time he was late getting on a plane and they had removed the jetway briefly and so he had to run down the stairs near the jetway to try to board from the back he said he knew that there were stairs in the back which were rarely used because they usually use the jetway and he's down on the tarmac, like waving at the pilot saying, hey, I need to get on board the plane. And apparently the pilot opens a window or something and says, look, we'll lower the we'll lower the back, go back there and we'll lower the stairs. And he says he goes to the back of the plane and he's standing underneath the air stairs and they start coming down slowly. And then something snapped or something. And, and the thing came flying down. Kaboom. He said it landed with landed with a heavy crash on the ground. ka -ching! And he said it barely missed his head. He had to like jump out of the way. He said, Those, so we start talking about Cooper and this eight old ATF guy goes, he goes, oh my God. He goes, I was nearly killed by those aft stairs once uh, of a 727. They nearly took my head off. And so apparently, probably those stairs were rarely used. So maybe this is in the 80s or early 90s and maybe it malfunctioned or something and and it just kaboom, it hit the ground. It nearly killed him. So that's a... Uh, that's definitely interesting. So I just want to relate that story that I was in a room full of FBI and ATF guys recently, and they all sat up when, when uh, D.B. Cooper was brought up. So let's see. Then we have the uh, his Cooper's geography 
tells is he uses, when they're discussing, he's saying, why aren't the parachutes there yet? And Tina says, oh, they're coming from McCord, blah, blah, blah. Cooper goes, hell, McCord is only 20 minutes from Tacoma. It doesn't take that long. And then he uses the phrase, we're over Tacoma now. So that's interesting. And in Tucson, this is uh, where we got Cooper being agitated a little bit. Uh, uh, Cooper's upset about this delay. And Cooper is getting pissy and says, if they think I'm bluffing, I'll show them. So there's I'll Cooper. Show them. And, he's, and he's waving his fist in the seat. He's like, oh, I'll show them that fucking yes. fans. I'll show them. <laughs> yeah, if they think I'm bluffing, I'll show them. So he was upset about this delay. Okay, let's see. Then um, did he not say did... it looks like Tacoma down there? He does because I want to give something interesting. Now, okay. whenever I went to CooperCon, that was the first time I ever went to Seattle. Okay, and aerial photographs of Tacoma are very easy to get. Like, even now, yes, we're in the internet age, but sure. there was aerial photography back then. The Pacific Northwest was aerially photographed. And I put into the Facebook group, uh, you know, beforehand, you know, I'm going to try and see if I can see Tacoma from the photograph. And guess what, Ryan? I did. Where I was able to look out and know that I was over Tacoma because Tacoma has a, like reservoirs or something or like lakes or something. It's very distinctive when you're up there. And, you know, the whole idea of, oh, Cooper must have knew the area. I didn't know the area. I'd never set foot in it. I never breathed the oxygen on it. But yet I knew when I was flying over it by looking out the window. And but another maybe kind of a giveaway, and I don't know if the pilots said it, but it, like they normally give you an update of where you are. It's like, oh, and we're just flying over Tacoma and they, we they are up on our not. approach to SeaTac Airport. Well, I don't know if they did then, but I mean, no. I was able to know Tacoma from the air, having never been over it ever. Well, the distinction though between you and Cooper, of course, is that Cooper knew how far away McCord Air Force, he, well, for one thing, he knew what McCord Air yeah. Force Base was and you know how far yeah. away it was from the airport. So, he certainly had been there at some point in his life. There's no doubt about that. Um, I don't, I've argued recently that I don't think he was a person who lived in Portland or Seattle. Cause I think that the risk would be too no. great of being spotted by someone who might know you in the airport or something. Um, so I, Somebody I would see him for spent, sure. He had spent some time there in the military. I would guess probably it would be my guess. So then once they land, this is interesting. This is in Tucson. Um, Tina says that Cooper tells them, okay, now have the air stairs move up. And Tina again mentions that she notes that the words air stairs is a airline term, really. Um, I would, I would, I don't know what I would call it, the stairs truck or something. I would just call it the stairs or portable. I don't know what I would call it, but he called it the air and, the, and another and another 302, did he call it the pickup rig as well, which again was very airliney. I think, that, can the pickup but, rig move? I think you're talking about the fuel something? trucks. I think fuel trucks is the word, but maybe though that, yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know about rigs, but a rig, a fuel rig would be a certain ter term for that, but I don't know about that. But the air stairs was for sure. Uh, yeah. Because okay, so, uh, they do have their own language, these airline yeah. peeps. Well, let's just keep up with it. I mean, so far we've got, in, we have Interphone, we have air stairs. We have uh, stations. Using the term station is interesting. So we got those are the ones we've got so far that maybe indicate that he had some airline experience for sure. So when Tina brings the money on board, he says that it looks okay. Use the term. He said it looks okay. So there's that. Yeah. Um, and this was this is an interesting one too. When Tina asked. When Tina's going to get the parachutes, now Tina has never touched a parachute in her life, almost certainly. Tina says, can I have a male crew member to help with the parachutes? Cooper says, they're not that heavy. You shouldn't have any trouble. So the fact Thank that you. Cooper knew how much, how heavy a parachute even weighed is indicative of something, have experience with parachutes, certainly. Because those MBs famously aren't that heavy. They, they're cause heavy, they, heavy they, enough, they, but... But, but I mean, compared to, like, that's a pilot's rig with everything off it. Like, your NB is the one that Cooper would have got. 
you know, that had been modified. And it's it not that about heavy. 40 pounds to me, maybe 40 pounds. So, some of them are a lot heavier. Like even for that era, some of them were way heavier. Like, I mean, we're talking big docile canopies with cape welds with additional harnesses. Cause uh, I mean, some of the fittings on them were made out of freaking iron. Yeah, sure. You know, I'm, I mean, st- like, uh, aluminum or aluminium was an, was expensive back then i mean like some of these old rigs were really heavy and he knew this particular one or had an idea that it wasn't going to be that heavy which I, I thought hmm you know did he have some sort of idea of what he would have been given did he did he sense well, he maybe I'll be coming, given the pilot's well, rig he he did think that well let's remember cooper as we said in the thing with Chris Cunningham last week, Cooper certainly thought that it was that the, and he probably went to his death and when, whenever that was assuming that the parachutes came from McCord. So he knew yeah. they were going to be military packs, um, which, which, but that's the one thing whenever I speak at rotary clubs or whenever I watch people at CooperCon go pick up Mark Meltzer's uh, MB6, they're always amazed at how heavy they are. They go, oh God, because they, they're not parachutes aren't huge, but because no. the fabric is so packed, folded tight, it's a it's a really dense, it's a dense thing. And so yeah. people are always amazed when they pick it, they go, oh God, this is heavy. I'm like, yeah, they're pretty heavy. But so Tina made three trips. Tina, it took her a trip a piece to bring the backpacks because they are heavy. And but she was able to bring the two front packs. Uh the two front packs. So that's what uh, the two front packs were brought. So anyway, so we know that. So then when she brings them on, she also has instructions for the parachutes. And Cooper says, I don't need those. That baffles me. That really, really baffles the crap out of me that that he said, no, thanks. I don't need them. So let's say no, no, I am at a skydiving level where I don't own my own stuff. I don't have my own rigs. I don't have my own gear. So if I go down to do a jump or an an exam jump or a level or whatever, is that I am given the rig and I am shown how to use it. And that's mandatory. The only exception to that is if I've got a log jump with it before, where this is a rig that he obviously had never used unless he was secretly a member of Skydive Issaquah and knew that (laughs) that's what he was coming with. Where, I mean, I, if you're a skydiver, you don't refuse the rig sheet. You just don't freaking do it because is the ripcord a, a air inflating pilot shoot? Is it spring loaded? Uh, is it on the left side? Is it on the right side? I mean, it's not as simple as jump, pull. I mean, there's more to it well, than it that. It could just, well, but that could be an indication that once he saw what they were, he goes, okay, I, I know what those are. I've worn those before. You know, that's why. He, you know, Tina says that as soon as she hands them the parachutes, he begins looking through them. He says that he begins examining them as soon as she handed them to him. And, but I do think that he recognized what they were. That's what I would say. He, he knew what, he knew what those shoots were because he had worn them at some point. Because all you're looking at, hmm? don't forget, whenever Cooper was looking at them, all he was looking at was a container. With the rig sure. sheet, that tells you everything that's inside that freaking container. Right. That's everything that's inside it. Where for him to refuse a rig sheet, because that's what we're looking at right now on the screen are the two rigs, and all we're looking at are containers. We don't know what's inside them. Right. We don't know what the lines are, how long they are. You know, the packing card has some information, but not an awful lot because packing instructions for different types of round or conical parachutes can be different. So, the, I mean, this is almost escape dependent too, because he, if let's pretend that he landed like Mary Poppins, he that sheet would be really handy in knowing how to collapse it down and put it back in the container. Right. Because it would be easier to get rid of. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'll actually, I have on the screen now a photograph of, the packing card for the uh, the one that he did, the parachute that Cooper didn't take. So you can see what the parachute, what, what the packing card actually looks like uh, there. So there's the Norman Hayden, uh, the Norman Hayden parachute there. So, okay. So next I'll move along. We, now this is the one that, this is the one that I is, this is in Tucson. 
And I, this might be one of the ones that if I had five minutes with Tina, I do think that, again, I do not think that Tusa ever lied about this, especially with Tusa's opinion of Cooper is that Cooper got himself killed. So Cooper's never got, so Tusa is never as an author going to um, attribute knowledge to Cooper that's not there. He's not going to invent knowledge to give Cooper something because he thinks Cooper's an idiot. So he has Tina remembering that Cooper says, hey, where's the D-rings? They should have known I needed D-rings, which are, again, as we've said, the things that you clip the parachute, the front packs onto. So the fact that he knew what D-rings even were, Martin McNally, I assure you, would not have known what a D-ring was. No. Nope. So the fact that he remembered, the fact that he knew what a D-ring was, it's not he's not a wuffo for sure. I I take that to the bank because he asked for two primary parishes, two fronts and two backs. Obviously, they needed to connect. I mean, again, I'm taking that to the bank too. I'm sorry. That's true. It's, yeah, he knew because he, he would just knew, ask for four yeah. backs. Right. Four backs. I mean, I mean, which is an equal or request as give me two fronts and two backs. He could have asked for four backs. I mean, back at six fronts. He like he doesn't specify fronts or backs, did he? Who who's that? Mac? He no. just said parachute. No, Mac. Um, I am trying to think of if any other hijackers requested reserve shoots. I'll have to look and see. Did that, Heinemann? Okay. Here's Chrissy. Uh, she's a member of our group. She's asking, what exactly is the difference between a front pack and a backpack? Uh, the obviously the fronts are going to be the reserve parachutes. I, I, I may, Jude, you talk to, you, you speak to that. I'll try to find an image for her. So your backpack parachute is your primary parachute. That's your main parachute with your rip cord on the right side, even in modern skydiving as it is back then, it's pulled with the right hand and your reserve parachute is pulled with the left. So back then in Cooper's time, the backpack parachute would have had D-rings on the backpack of which they attach a front-mounted chest reserve. In modern rigs, both the main and the reserve are in the backpack, but back then that wasn't the case. So you could go out with a reserve on its own, like a lot of smoke jumpers did, and the way Martin McNally exited. Like, he asked for six parachutes, and he got six fronts. I mean, that's attempted murder. They were trying to kill that guy, and it, it just it didn't work. Um, but that's the difference between the back and the front. So that's the configuration, yeah. As the backpack, it's clipped onto the front with D rings. You're on mute, Ryan. You've muted yourself. I, I pulled up an image here of a skydiver from the '60s, so you can see, Chrissy, that you can see the backpack there, and so that the pack is your main backpack. That that's your that's your main parachute. Then on the front is your little front reserve. So the, you can't really see in there, but maybe you can. There's little clips. There's little clips there on that front reserve and, the, and they hook on to the straps of the backpack. So like, imagine if you're wearing a backpack going to, going to school and your front backpack and your backpack had like clips on it, that something that you could clip something on the front to those, to your backpack on the front. So yeah, that's the front pack. If your back, if your backpack screwed up, you would cut it away and open your, open your reserve chute. So there's the, there's that image. Hopefully that hopefully that makes sense to you, Chrissy. Um, so okay, so let's move on. So where's the D rings? And they don't need D rings. Okay. Now here's another thing, and this is totally confirmed. There are people who think this is not true, but it is. This has been confirmed a million times over. I've I, I even have information that I won't divulge at this time, but this is 100 percent true. When when to, when he was told when Tina tells Cooper. She is afraid that the crew is getting tired because they've been flying all day. He said, quote, don't worry, I've got some pills that will keep them awake. This is the Benzedrine pills. This is amphetamine, speed, whatever you want to call it. Um, I am of the opinion that when Cooper goes to the bathroom, he probably relieves himself. But when he's in there, I'm guessing he also took a drink from the sink because he had not had anything to drink. He had been smoking cigarettes. He had not had anything to drink for three hours at that point. And all he had ever had to drink was a little bit of bourbon and seven up. So I'm guessing he probably 
took some took, took some drink from the sink and may have popped one of his pills while I was in there. I think that'd be a smart time to do it. It's 6 p.m. And disarmed the bomb? Yes. I've got, <laughs> yeah, I, I do think He that, brought the bomb under the crapper. Nancy House said that he bought the he brought the bomb in the creepy paper bag under the crapper with him. Yes. So bang the ben, benzadrine, dis disarmed the bomb. I'm a back to see, but I again I'm taking that to the bank too. The benzadrine, it's it's no, I mean copycats. The other copycats did bring amphetamines, except for the good Mormon kid McCoy, because that wasn't allowed by the LDS at that time. He was eating ever, candy. Even since. He was eating nerds or whatever. Yeah. The Skittles or whatever the heck. I mean, Pez. McCoy had his Pez, Pez dispenser Pez. beside his machine gun. He had a D.B. Cooper Pez, Pez dispenser. <laughs> if there was a Cooper Pez dispenser and McCoy had one, that would be hilarious. McCoy had it. I think that if I, that, that if someone ever did like a comedy animation of, of these high, of these copycats, they that, a, a, a D.B. Cooper Pez dispenser with one of them would be really funny. So, you know, Cooper. their hero. So, but no, Benzedrine is confirmed from Ratacek and I've got it from Tina as well. So there's definitely Benzedrine, 100%. Uh, Heinemann actually did have legitimate Benzedrine. He actually straight up had Benzedrine, known to have Benzedrine with him. Um, uh, McNally can't remember what drug he had with him, uh, but he had some sort of amphetamine speed with him. He did say that. So yep. I do think Cooper takes his pill when he goes uh, into the lavatory. I think he goes to the bathroom. He's a middle-aged man. He probably goes to the bathroom, but he also drank from the sink. So... And we know that he turned down all refreshments because Tina says that she repeatedly asked him if he wanted refreshments and he says no. And so there's that. And um, because he was, I've asked McNally, that's the benefit of having McNally on speed dial is I asked Mac, I sent him a text message a while back and I said, hey, uh, did you take any, did you drink anything on the flight? He goes, no. I said, why? It's because I was worried they were going to drug me with something. And it's, I think because they had roofies yeah, in it. Yes, it, absolutely. And and we have examples of them doing that with Rufalin was given to one copycat. Is that right? Yes. Uh, Glenn Tripp, who was the <laughs> Glenn Tripp was the copycat who was way late to the party. The Cooper vein, this was in 1982. So there was no way he was ever going to jump out of a 727 by that point. But he's the guy who they kept drugging him. They kept putting volume in his drinks. And well, he's worse. the guy who eventually kept lowering his ransom from, from a million dollars, kept lowering his own ransom because he was getting lo loopier and loopier and finally ends up with, I want three cheeseburgers and a head start and a getaway car. Yes. <laughs> so, which is the greatest. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. yeah Glenn Tripp was tripping. Uh, sadly, to put a, to put a sad, a sad epilogue on Glenn Tripp, he was a young guy who was a bit, he had learned he was learning disabled and they knew that he was learning disabled after he got drugged. Well, Glenn Tripp tried it a second time about a year later, same airport in Seattle. He does the same thing and they don't know who he is. They don't know it's Glenn Tripp again. And they go on the plane and they shoot him and oh, no. kill him. And uh, it was I believe it was uh, John Detler was still there. And he mentioned that it was really sad that all the FBI guys were like, oh, crap, it's Glenn. Like, because they had dealt with him and he wasn't even convicted of the previous attempt because of his, his disorder. So he got out and did it again. Yeah, we, we wouldn't be fit to stand trial. I mean, if it, and the, yeah. you know, if he's intellectual disabilities, he wouldn't have been fit to stand trial yeah. or capacity to consent to an attorney, blah, 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 blah. Right. Wow, they shot him. God, crap. Yeah, they, yeah, they felt really bad about killing him because they were like, oh, man. And he was like 21 years old. He was a young guy, too. So um, that's a kind of a sad epilogue there. So now we've got Cooper's. The, Tina says, OK, you've got the money. You have the parachutes. What next, pal? He says. You, you tell them this, we're going to Mexico City, gears down, flaps down. You can stop anywhere in Mexico to refuel, but nowhere in the United States. The aft door must be open. That's that door that the girls were sitting on. And the stairs need to be down. The altitude must be under 10,000 feet. They know they can't go over that. Cabin lights out and everyone is to be forward of the first class cabin. Let's dissect this. The altitude must be under 10,000 feet. They know they can't go over that. That is 
the pilots, this is a, I mean, this is a guy who understands that oxygen gets thin above 10,000 feet. And if your door is open and your stairs are down, remember Cooper thought they were going to take off with the stairs down, but with the stairs down, door open, oxygen is going to be a problem if you go above 10,000 feet. And I think that is when, when Cooper says they know they can't go over that, he's talking about the pilots knowing they can't go over that. This is a pilot to me telling other, saying, hey, I'm a pilot. I know that I'm, they know what I know, essentially. And they know that you can't go that over 10,000 feet without oxygen being a problem. Is this because of the gear? Is that, um, uh, and this is a, a great resource in the group, uh, as uh, I believe Bernie Harrigan uh, yes. was a 727 pilot and has been very, very quick to debunk a lot of commonly held vortex myths. And I think, and again, Bernie, apologies if misquoting, but uh, can I think he, he put up a post one time that the, the gear being down over 10,000 feet can give incorrect readings on the dials because it would cause too much drag and turbulence, or it would be, it would just, it's too complicated and the configuration and the well, likelihood of stalling is way higher. Well, 10,000 feet is, I don't know about that, but 10,000 feet is important though, because that is when automatic pressurization would kick in. So mm -hmm. oh, their, yeah. their Auto sensors pressure. would automatically pressurize the plane. And of course you cannot pressurize a plane when the doors are open anyway. So the, mm -hmm. uh, it would not have worked so but that's that's 10,000 feet and above is where pressurization kicks in but mainly it's hypoxia that's when you know that that was the max altitude yeah with the aircraft unpressurized that was as high as they could go without there being a problem with the oxygen and to that end tina does say she does we have this quote quote tina says let's see yeah tina tina tells cooper you know we have oxygen and he responded yes i know where it is and I will That's I really it. interesting as well. Yes, if I I know where it is, and if I if I need it, I'll get it. And I'll put up here this photograph here. The oxygen, if you see there it, the, on the ground there, this is good pod for the podcast listeners. I'm sorry, but there's a little compartment on the ground next to the bathroom there. That little compartment is where they kept the oxygen bottles. Okay, yeah. I don't know of any. And Tina herself says. The, the oxygen bottles. She goes, there, there's no way that any lay person would know where those were. To her, no. that was the biggest indicator that he was really familiar with the 727 is that he knew where they stored the, the portable oxygen bottles. So, and they were discreet and they were discreet because I mean, with sure. airlines and the design of the 727, with any of the emergency features, whether it was the oxygen regulators, the water pressure pumps, and everything else, it was all very much hidden and flush and with the interior of the, fl the fuselage. And with that compartment, I mean, even without a visual for the podcast listeners, it was discreet and behind the seat, and you wouldn't notice it unless it was pointed out to you. But this man, this hijacker, knew it was there because you right. would not notice otherwise. Right. I'll, I'll bring this up to, I'll, I'll bring this to the, uh, to the people there. Let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can do this. Give me one second. People uh, hang out with me here for a second. Let's see. I'm going to show everybody the, what it looks like. This is a seven. This is the, also the 727 manual. When you're a Cooper nerd, your, your 727 manuals are uh, certainly important to look at. If you're a, a vortex person who's trying to understand this, this is the where the location is. You can see here, this says portable oxygen cylinders. You can see where in the visual here, where they're pointing to those little things that are that, that abut the bulkhead doors, those little com compartments. So Cooper says, if I need them, I'll get them. I know where they are. So that really indicated to her that he that that, that, that he knew that that was um you know there. So back to it. This is interesting. So Cooper says flaps down. This is gear down, flaps down. In Tucson, he has them calling back. The cockpit sought clarity about the flap setting. They said, what, what flaps do you want? And all he responded was 15. Or, or we'll be flying at 15 is another way. That, that's actually in the 302. We'll be flying at 15 degrees. So that is something else that Perhaps that almost certainly, I would not, I would have no idea what settings flaps are. I mean, none. I mean, I. And you know what? I've tried to look at it, like, to, you know, to really like try and understand it. 
and I could not grasp it. And I, I, I think I have at least four brain cells. And I thought, in these four brain cells, I'll be able to pick this up. And I just, I, 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 I couldn't. And the only way that you would pick up flap settings, especially in flight configs for takeoff and landing, because I, like what, and what I did learn in this silly research is that, I mean, there's three main challenges of a pilot. I mean, it's takeoff, landing, and flying f- through bad weather. And this is where the flaps thing came in, was the flying through bad weather. Mm-hmm. And I did not understand what their function was, what they were needed for, or anything else. And I, I, I wouldn't care as long as the freaking door was open and the parachute was on my back and we were going slowly. That's all I would want. I mean, with the 15, why did he want 15? I have no idea. But I'm sure there was method in the madness. Well, somewhere. the reason, I mean, the current, my current thinking is that we know that the Air America when Air America was doing their drops with 727s in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, they were, the drops were done with gear down and flaps at 15 degrees. So that's a certainly a, a, a key indicator there. And I'm going to pull up here. I'll say for everybody, this is the, this is what it looks like inside the cockpit of a 727. Uh, you can see here the gear or the, 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 the mechanism here for the flaps. So, they had five degree flaps, 15, 20, 25, and 30, and then all the way down, all the way down to 40. So 15 degrees was a flap setting. Cooper knew this. Cooper knew that this was a flap setting on a 727. I, who the hell would know that other than somebody who has a familiarity with that? So. And even, although this is mainly about what Cooper actually said, you know, from Bill Ratajkowski. I mean, I, he's all—he's on my. I—I I would just love to have a beer with this guy. And as yeah. a quote from him, he's like, "Oh, this man knew his way around an airplane." You know, right. and he did. He did, sure, sure. I mean, I don't think that's ever—that was never a doubt for those guys at Northwest. I mean, they—they they certainly. I, I mean, yeah, I, I just don't think that was ever a doubt. He was certainly a, a pilot or knew very well what the guys up front were able to do. So. Let's and see. this isn't something you get from library books. I mean, there's this whole thing. Oh, he went to the library. I know Mac said he went and sat in the library, sure. but Mac did not have anywhere near this whole concept of flaps no. and pressurization and everything else from going to the library that Cooper did. No, and that's just Mac being... If you know, if you know Mac, I can just see Mac doing that and thinking he's doing research when he's really not. That's just, yeah. if, you, if you know, I hope, hope Mac, you're watching. I, I love you, Mac. And you're, you're, love a, you too. I mean, you're, you're not, you're an icon, but, but I don't think Mac would admit that he would not, that was not his forte was intellectual aviation stuff. So, but it was experience. It's, it's not about intellect because Mac, an incredibly intelligent, deep, and he had experience, man. you know, 1800 hours in a, in a plane, but yeah. even he still didn't in, know. In the military. Right. I, I've asked Mac, Mac was flight crew for, almost 2000 hours in the military. And I asked Mac, I said, did you know what the flaps did? He said, no. He said, uh, I knew that they, the pilots mentioned flaps when they took off and landed, but that's about it. So, you know, that's, that's all Mac knew to take off and landing. Can I highlight a comment from Nikki that says, don't forget to mention Cooper saying that the stairs could be lowered from the cockpit. Oh, well, you got that before. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're going in chronological order. So hold your horses, oh. Broughton. We're getting there. Okay. Wait. All right. So we've got next, we have uh, the money is brought on. Well, after all this, uh, we have Flo going back there. And she says, Cooper started talking about how heavy the money bag was and then proceeds to play a dad joke on her and says, hey, can you pick this up? Because Flo was half Filipino. She was a small person. And he said, pick this up. And Flo picks it up and goes, yeah, that sure is heavy. And this is when Flo gets insulted. Um, she, we have this quote of hers. She says he began acting, he began acting childish. And I think that that's been interpreted as him jumping up and down going, hee, 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 hee. But I think what she's indicating is that he was being rather unserious in a very serious moment. Uh, I think he was trying to period. maybe, I think he was trying to ease the tension. Sure. But he was a dick about it. Yeah, he was mansplaining sort of 
I yeah, mean, like a man of his era would have done. Yeah, a dad joke essentially at the expense of a young woman. I, I, you know. Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead, Missy. See, I'll see, you see, you pick it up. Ha ha. And almost gloating in a way too. You're gloating about how much money you've got in a way. But, it it, it but can like, be perceived he, that way. Because what what the 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 MB six right that he'd already had by this point. I mean, the money bag was twenty pounds. It was half the weight of the parachute. If he wanted to demonstrate weight, and if a if a if a young girl could lift something, why not ask her to lift the parachute? I mean, what a tool, <laughs> you know? Because it was. I mean, it was half. I mean, if you, you divide the parachute in two, that was the money. The big stupid right. bag, the big cotton drawstring bag, the Looney Tunes money bag. Yes, I've said it for anybody playing the Cooper Bingo. Bingo. Thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, the creepy, the creepy bag, and, and you have the Looney Tunes money bag. Yes, see, so then uh, we have Flo. Pretty much, oh, she is well over the situation. Flo says, "Can can I leave the plane?" And Cooper says, in a quote, calm, uninterested manner, "Sure, go ahead." And then now, some new knowledge has come, and I don't want to divulge it because I'm not, I'm not supposed to. But like some, basically it's come to my attention and some other people's attention that Flo and Alice left the aircraft at different times. So I've always wondered, there's a discrepancy in Flo says that Cooper says, sure, go ahead. You can leave in an uninterested manner. Then we have Alice's 302 when she says, can we leave? Can the stewardesses leave? Because she's the head stewardess. She says, can the stewardesses leave? Cooper says, whatever you girls would like. So, I vote for that one. Yeah, Number well, two. I think he said both because I think he may have said, sure, go ahead to Flo who checks out. Mm -hmm. And then Alice on her own is back there with Tina mm -hmm. and says, can we leave? And he I says, think the, the, would like. From the 302s, it's a, whatever you ladies would like, did he say? I think it's girls. Or whatever, your girls, is it? Yeah, because again, using the word girls even too. Whereas, yes, so like ladies were married, like girls, young girls. as a Again, it's just an odd word to use, but again, it's it's see. bankable. You know, whatever you girls would like, just this old condescending man. It is girls, whatever you girls would like. Yeah, yeah. so it is girls. Okay, so then, uh, as Fla as Alice is leaving, uh, he Cooper yells out. He says, "Here, take these. I don't want them. That's the money." So he handed Flo and Alice each tried to a two thousand dollar packet. So earlier he had tried to give them the loose change from his pocket, the $19. And they said, oh, we can't accept gratuities. But then as they're leaving again, he tries again. He says, here, take these. I don't want them. And hands them each, a, tries to hand them each a packet, a $2,000 $2, packet. And they again say, we can't take them, which is interesting. In McNally's hijacking, the girls did take the money. They uh, he, he offered them $2,500 and they took it and immediately gave it to the FBI thinking there'd be fingerprints on it. So that, that was their thinking. They did take it. And it's interesting. I think that in, in Tussauds book, he has, yeah, in Tussauds book, he has Alice telling him that she wishes that she had taken the money because it could have been, they could have got fingerprints off of it. So she did um, think, think that. So let's see. Then as they get off, the uh, flow remembers that her, that her purse is in that place where the oxygen bottles were. That's we have learned from stewardesses from the time period that that is where on a 727, if they were working the back cabin, that's where they would put their that's where they'd put their purses because nobody would ever look there to steal from them. That's where they put their purses. So she comes back, she forgot her purse because obviously the plane is about to be headed to destinations unknown, as far as she was concerned. So she wanted her purse, and she goes, "Can I get my?" purse. And he goes, he smiles at her and says, sure, go ahead. I won't bite you. Weird I man. Bite. Or I won't bite. I won't bite you. Something to that. Is, I, don't, I don't bite. I won't bite you. Something of that it's nature. The word, it's the word bite. It's the word bite. It's just, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, dad it, jokes. Dad jokes. Yeah, it's it's a dad joke for sure. That's how, that's how a dad talks. Um, Okay, then we we know from that Cooper got maddest. The maddest that Cooper got was when the fuel trucks kept having these vapor lock problems, allegedly. And they kept having to back away the fuel trucks and bring new fuel trucks up. 
And Cooper shouts out, damn it, they're stalling. Tell them to get with it. I won't take this. And Tina and, and Flo or Tussaw has Cooper pounding his fist into his other fist saying, I won't take this. They're stalling. Damn it. So even though Tina did say he was, remember, Tina says, even though he was impatient a few times. So here is certainly evidence of that saying, hey, um, somebody says how much would that money be worth today? I believe it's about one point four million, one point three something of that nature. Um, now here we have the a, a a a discrepancy in in a very as if you missed my myths and misconceptions. This is one that is so frustrating because it would tell us so much about Cooper. Is when he's saying I want to take off with the air stairs down. They say, we're not going to do that. And Cooper says one of two things. He either says, yes, they can take off with the stairs down, but the cockpit can put it down after they get airborne. Now, 727s, the rear stairs could only be controlled from the back. So from the, the, the lever that would lower the stairs at the very back of the plane, cockpit controls lowering the back are on the C-130 and another, there's another, there's another cargo plane, uh, Packer, if you're, if you're in Packer, if you're there, what was the name of that plane that you found where they would also jump out? Military jumpers would jump out the back, not a C-130. There's another one. I forget what it is, but those could be controlled from the cockpit. But we also have Tina saying that Cooper says a caribou. Yes. A caribou. caribou. Yeah. We also have Cooper saying Yes, you can lower them from the, or, or, or yes, you can take off with the stairs down, but that's all right. We can lower them later. That is a world of difference. Yeah. I mean, that is night and day because one shows that Cooper doesn't know a damn thing actually about a 727. The other one knows that, or that keeps it vague, right? When he says, hey, we can lower it later. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, which one of these you want to believe? Either he says the cockpit can put it down after they're airborne. I'm going to send to believe that it was, yes, you can, but we can lower it later. Because this guy has already shown that he knows what flap settings were on a 727. He knows when they pressurize. He knows where the oxygen bottles are. He's going to know the plane. He surely knows that the cockpit and couldn't lower it later on. I think that, and, and, hey, and again, and again, another thing that speaks to that. He says he wanted to keep Tina there to help him lower the stairs. Well, if he thought the cockpit could lower it, he didn't need Tina. He would just say, I'll blow the bomb up if you don't, if you guys don't lower it for me when we're airborne, if, right? So I, I think he knew that I don't buy that the, him saying cockpit. Do you, do you agree? I don't, bu I don't buy it. I don't buy it either. And here's another plus point for the 727. Because if you look at the timeline, which is on the norjack.org site, it's roughly around, let's say around 6.30ish, we landed at 5.43, so at 6.30ish, that's when Cooper says the line, this shouldn't be taking this long. Yeah, because right. with a 727, for a pop quiz, how long does it take to refuel a 727 from dead to full? It's a, just under half an hour. So he knew that over half an hour has passed. Something's, this should not be taking wrong. this long. Yeah. With two fuel trucks at that point, the yeah. second had already arrived by then. Is that right? Yeah. And yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, they, they ended up having to use three fuel trucks. They had three. vapor lock problems. And that's where uh, even Captain Scott gets upset because Captain Scott says in Unsolved Mysteries, we told them if you guys are screwing, if you guys are screwing around down there, knock it off because yeah. half know, an hour, if half an hour filled the tank completely. Yeah. So uh, um, like, and, and that's what it is. It's like, I, I don't know the exact, but it was, you know, those. Uh, fuel rigs could pump at a certain liters per minute and the fuel tank and it was it was just under half an hour between 25 and 27 minutes filled well, the whole thing up and he knew and that's some other some symmetry between cooper and the pilots is that they're in the front getting weirded out because it's taking so long and he's in the yeah. back going being weirded out because it's taking so long so that's symmetry but that's common knowledge that both of them knew this matt i guarantee you McNally would have no idea. If I texted him right now and said, Matt, did, do you know how long it took to fill up a 727? He'd go, hell no. No, not even remotely. So 
that speaks to something. Certainly speaks to something. So there's that. Because even so, at this point, right, we're yeah. we're on nearly two hours, right? But the, this guy hasn't said an awful lot of words. Like if you co- quantify all the words, it's less than say I don't know, maybe a thousand, whatever, right? Oh, way, way but less. We can tell a hell of a lot about this man by the way he said things, and in what context in which he said them. Right. You know, it's it's a lot. It's a lot. And I mean. I mean, someone with this type of knowledge that's waving money around, that's offering money around. I know I mentioned it earlier, you know, that there's the whole old Cooper was a blue collar hero. I mean, this guy was not blue collar. He was waving 20s before he got a big bag full of 20s. And when he got the big bag full of 20s, he was offering them out. Mm -hmm. You know, this, I I mean, if this was someone that was truly, like, I'm not going to say this isn't a financially motivated crime. Again, back to the Mickey Mantle baseball card. But... (laughs) He wanted money, but he could spare some of it where he's like, I can, I can give five or six grand away. As we say, well, I guess the way to put that is he did not have a $200,000 on the nose problem. No. Because he was giving some of it away. Yeah. So it's not like he had a problem that required $200,000 on the nose. I would say. So certainly he knew that. So let's see. Next. Let's see. Okay. When Tina says, when Cooper says, hey, why aren't we taking off yet? Tina says, well, the pilots, because remember, the Tina's were laying everything from the pilots on the inner phone to Cooper. She goes, well, the pilots are saying that they have to file a flight pan, plan. Cooper says, never mind that. They can do that over the radio once we get up. Let's get the show on the air or, or let's get the show on the road. Or he says they can pick it up in the air. I think the actual term is pick it up in the air because the that's. Air. That is actually in the tra- in the transcript from Radicek. He mentions picking it up in the air. And again, Soderlund later on says that he was reviewing the transcripts and Cooper says, pick it up in the air. Very piloty thing to say. Let's get the show on the road. Uh, so there's that. So uh, that's another famous line of his. Let's get the show on the road. But that's why after he says, no, no. And again, as we've said a million times, I feel like a broken record. Cooper is calling their bluff on that. And he and, and he was and he was right. Like uh, I mean, he he was totally correct. But uh, uh, I know this is probably inconsequential for the sake of it. But you know, at the before this or around this time, there was the bickering back and forth between you know Captain Scott and Cooper where they were actually going. Because uh, I, I don't, it's it's not on the pre-prepared sheet that we had. But originally, wasn't it San Francisco that they were like it was Mexico, but yeah, with LA. a fuel stop in San or. Uh, in LA, LA and he said, Stanford. well, well, LA is a long way south of San Francisco. So, I mean, it was originally, yes, yeah. yeah, San Francisco and maybe somewhere else around there. But yeah. And he says that he says those airports are too busy, too busy. Yeah. He says, too, he said, he says too busy. And why the hell does he care if it's too busy? He was not, his boots weren't going to be in the ground around LA. He was going to be gone by LA probably. But I mean, even for him to counter with Phoenix or did he say either just Phoenix or can we stop in Phoenix? I think he offers or, Reno and Phoenix. He, he, or I mean, he, it's just, he, is there? that sequence is not my best, is not my best uh, idea. That, that sequence of um, events is, is who suggested what. I believe that Cunningham, I always defer to him on communications. Um, and I believe that he says it's Soderland who says, hey, suggest Reno. And he says, you know, Reno makes a wise, a good choice for a wise hijacker. And Cooper agrees. Cooper says, okay, Reno's fine. So they were, they were just, they were, they were flattering him. Yeah. And he kind of took it, you know, pandering to him. I, I like know, this too, is that, is that uh, Nikki says that San Fran and those other places were too close to the coast. So maybe that to get there from Seattle, they would have flown not on Victor 23. They would have flown a different, maybe a different route that, that was closer to the coastline. Yeah. And that would have not, it's not where he wanted to jump out, clearly. Like, I mean, with 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 Radichak and the, you know, the flight crew, I mean, their moral compass is beyond question. But I, if I was flying the plane and, and Cooper said San Francisco or whatever, I would absolutely fly over the sea and say, you're good to go. So whenever, whenever he does the whole so long suckers throw, throws <laughs> open the parachute and looks down, he's like, "Oh crap!" Yeah, uh, I didn't like. I didn't think this through. But well, I, mean, uh, look, I mean, what you're saying, I mean, there, it, it, it's actually we have actual 
evidence of this. Uh, Radicek wants to fly out over the ocean. He, yeah. he suggested it. He said, hey, can we do this? And th- they thought about it and said, well, let's not do anything stupid. It's kind of murder. It kind of murder. Well, kinda, and then yeah. you're, we're doing something that we're doing something that puts us in danger too. So I think that they just decided against it, but he did, he was mad. He wanted to get this guy in the, in the ocean for sure. So let's see. Uh, next we have, I'll play this clip. This is as they're about to take off, as they're, as they're about to take off, uh, Tina starts to freak out a little bit about the prospect of, of opening the stairs while the plane's in, plane's in flight. And we have this quote here. I'll play this from Radicek in the 2016 D.B. Cooper case closed. But we didn't know whether or not that door opening was going to cause this air to escape. We didn't know whether you would be sucked out of the airplane. So I got on the line and I said, Tina, here's what I want you to do. We have escape ropes that are in the overhead. So I told her that we'll cut a piece of that rope off and then I want you to put pillows around your stomach, tie that rope around your stomach and tie it to one of the legs. So I told her that we'll have Andy bring a rope back. You had that phone and you squeezed it so that we could hear what was going on. No one's coming back here, he said. Okay. So that's another Cooper quote. No no one's coming back here, he shouts, as they're saying, "Can, can Anderson bring a rope back to tie Tina to a seat? And This is when Cooper's like, okay, nobody's coming back here. And then Tina begins to freak out some more. And basically Cooper just says, when she starts explaining the, the, uh, how to do the, you know, that when they're discussing what to do, Cooper just says, never mind, I'll do it. And sends her to the front. If it's it's out of Radichak's, I know Radichak, a very colorful guy, but I, I believe that totally because, and the and the discussion of was Cooper influenced by Cini? Now Cini was bludgeoned by a pilot or by a crew member or somebody. Yeah. Where Cooper wasn't risking that. He wasn't risking like he's happy to have a young lady who's obviously smaller in height and build than him than say perhaps a six foot pilot that could just bludgeon him with a, one of the emergency axes. Yeah. You know, he wasn't he wasn't taking that chance. So him saying they're not coming back because he didn't allow the pilots to go and lift the parachutes either. Right. So they weren't coming back. So I, I totally buy that. I always, and I always like the imagery, too, of during McNally's hijacking, the fact that Mac had no idea how to put on a parachute harness. And one in and, and one of the flight in, in the flight engineer. Had had to come back and with Mac at, at gunpoint holding the gun on him, says, put it on. And I, I want to see you put it on. I want to see how it's done. Mm-hmm. And so I find that find that interesting. And, uh, and all credit to the engineer because at Cooper, call, I do you know that uh, front mounted harness? I gave that to Mac, and Mac has that now. Mm-hmm. And, and Mac didn't actually know this because whenever Mac had got it on, I was it was a bit of a scramble to get it on. They are very hard to get on, but I, I don't know if it was Meltzer or somebody had said all he had to do was to turn this valve at your back that you wouldn't see just slightly to the left. So whenever you'd throw open the front, I would wrap the harness off. <laughs> like, and Mac was just like, no shit. And I, and they're like, yeah. And it was like, the, the, they were trying to kill. I think he realized that. Yeah. I, they tried to kill him by giving no. him unpointed and reserves and those harnesses and those just, I'd had the Cape well, the big thing at the back. It's funny now that is an actual, there, when, when we say they're trying to kill him, like we're not joking. Like there is literally a newspaper article from the next day from McNally's hijacking where the pilot says we were trying to kill him. So uh, five, uh, five, 500 kilometers an hour. I think where they were going was miles an hour. Uh, Like, uh, and, uh, but all they had to do, because what the the Cape well on the front, uh, and again with Cooper, it would have been easy to do. You just, you just take one onto half and that's it. Because, I mean, a, a quick release is exactly what it's designed to be. It's to release if you're strung up on a tree yeah. <laughs> with those old harnesses. And all they had to do, because with the opening shock of an emergency, right, I could take the harness with them mm-hmm. or take it with the rig. And they, and, and they didn't do that. So all, all credit to Max Flight Crew for not uh, loosening that one thing. So we've got, then we've got uh, Cooper tells Tina, he says, go to the cockpit. Close the first class curtains on your way up and don't come back. 
nobody behind the first class section. So he says that. And as she's leaving, Tina says, what are you going to She says, please, please take the bomb with you. He responds, I'll take it with me or I'll disarm it before I leave. So there's that. Next, we have Bill Ratajkowski again saying that. Why didn't he reassure her that it was fake? Why didn't he say, oh, don't worry, Tuss, it's fake. I've already got the money. Uh, I mean, ha, 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 you know, more fool you. Good point. Why would it matter at that point? Like, I mean, he's he has got the rig on his back. I mean, with the imagery, he's got the drag bag tied and the rig on his back. And he said, I'll disarm it or take it with me. Where if this bomb was fake, that was the perfect moment to say, listen, you've been lovely. You're a very kind young lady. And I want to reassure you and please reassure the flight crew now that the door is open that the bomb is not real. And, right. he did and not the do flight that. crew, honestly, <laughs> he had there was no disadvantage for him to saying it was fake at that point because no. even, even if he had he won. said that, well, but let's just, you won, but also they would not even take, even if he said that, they still weren't going to take the chance that no. he was just saying that. Because maybe, maybe oh, oh, I mean, if I'm piloting, I'm like, well, maybe he's just telling her that to calm her down. I'm, not, I'm still not, I'm still not going to believe it. But Tina would believe it from him because he's looking at her in the face to face, saying it. I know he gave a I, I know he gave a fake name, but I whenever he said I'll disarm it, mm, I I I believe the fake name liar guy that's a thief at this point for for that because I I do think that the bomb was real and I think that's indicative of that because he had every opportunity to reassure everybody and he didn't take it. Why? Because it was real. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and he the fact left. That he say, he left leave it behind. Yeah. I mean, he could have just said it's not Remy. Yeah. The fact that he even used the terminology, I'll disarm it, is disarm it. Some, that's a word something. that's in there. That's in the file. It's in the file. Yeah. The, 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 that word in particular. Yeah. And so but then now this is a this is one that's different. And and I do think that this is. I would love to know the truth of this. We have two varying descriptions. This is Bill Ratajkowski talking about at about 7, I guess 42 maybe, when Cooper's trying to lower the stairs, the stairs won't go down all the way. This is what Bill Ratajkowski says. Now it gets really noisy. And so he's, I, I can't get the... The stairs down, well, I've got to get the stairs down. The stairs won't open up. And all this noise. So Radicek is saying that Cooper is saying, I can't get the stairs down. The stairs won't open up. Basically, help me out. But in Tussauds' book, Radicek, apparently, or maybe Tina, Tina listening on headphones, says that when Cooper called up, Cooper says, slow down a little. I can't get the staircase down. Now, if, if that is what Cooper said, that again really speaks to somebody who understands what they're doing because he's understanding that, that the increased wind is pushing up on the staircase. So he says, slow down a little bit. I can't get the staircase down. As somebody who leans toward the Bill Ratajkowski school of 40 years later embellishment, I'm going to go with... Cooper saying, slow down a little bit. I can't get the stairs yeah, down. Me too. Because Radicek likes to, as much as we love Bill, in his big fish stories that he's said over the years, he injects himself a little bit maybe um, to it. Because he, he has said different things. I mean, he says that he's the one who said, our friend just took leave of us. We know now, thinking we believe that was Scott who said that. Scott. Um, after they landed even. At some point, he said, our friend left us, something like that. Um, Radicek says that uh, that he was flying the plane. There's indications that the plane was on autopilot, actually. So he says he was hand flying the plane down Victor 23 when we have evidence from 71 saying it was an auto on autopilot, actually. So I would tend to, th again, when you've got, as I'm writing my book, I when, when, if I do come across things that are, discrepant with each other. As an author, you have to decide what am I going to believe? And you have to determine this. And my, I usually might, might determine it to differentiate between which one I want to believe. I look at which one's closest to the event. Yeah. And 
that and and we've got you know slow down a little bit i can't get the staircase down around 10 years or so after the event again this is somebody remembering something that happened in 2015 or 2014 as opposed to somebody in the year 2050 remembering some something that was said in 2014 big difference but i, I but what he's saying what cooper said there when he said when, if he actually said slow down that's backed up by physics because what people sure. think with the aft stairwell is that it was electronic that you just you flipped a, a lever or a switch and it went all the way down it was a hydraulic lever mm -hmm. that I mean, and hydraulics is, you know, air and pressure where if the plane was going too fast, he probably couldn't get the lever all the way down. Well, it's my understanding. Or for it that, to open. Okay. So my understanding is that on a 727-51 or a 100, I think, I think they have different names for them, but I think that the 727s, they were, they had, they, they had hydraulics to raise them but lowering them was just done by gravity. It was, they had like, I would say that they had, I don't know what the terminology is. Somebody who's an engineer knows, but one of those things where, you know, you can release the, the Kraken, you can release it, but it's got some kind of thing that makes it lower at a certain speed. So it doesn't just go, so, so, so it doesn't just go kaboom. Right. I mean, yeah. there is something that keeps it from going down fast, but it's still totally gravity pushing it down. So yeah. He would need his body weight to put the the stairs all the way to extend sure. them fully. Yes, and fully, his body weight would have to go all the way to the bottom of it. Like the idea of him walking down an already extended stairway, stairwell and going, so long, suckers, or Geronimo, where like Mac, our good friend, Uncle Mac, he scooched down the stairs on his bum, on his backside, uh, held on with his arms, where... I mean, with Cooper, we talk about the jump, but in all likelihood, the man either slipped or fell off the stairs. I mean, I, like a jump, yeah, well, I mean, it's an exit, but I mean, this romantic, you know, arch and jump with the money tied to him probably didn't happen. It's a, he probably scooched sure. down slowly because this plane's jigging around and stuff like that, and then he just went... Yeah, the video the we've got, the video of the pursuit of D.B. Cooper, this is very dramatic. The guy going Geronimo off the back yeah. of it. I, I don't believe that at all. I mean, no. we, we've spoken to, I mean, I, whenever I speak to Rob Hetty, I'd love to know how he exited being an actual skydiver, how he, how he got off the stairs. Did he jump or did he, I mean, I guess you do want to. Probably went forward. That's you, how I'd do it. Well, well, I would go down. I'd go down on the bum and then like, cause see with a, a tandem exit, well, you would tuck your feet underneath the aircraft and the instructors behind you. What I would do if I were Cooper, I would scooch down on my bum, put my feet underneath the stairs cause I'm already arched cause my feet are like that head up and down. That's, I would, I would bet anything that that's what Rob Hetty did. Yeah. And well, and also too, I guess you want to jump. I mean, you, you want to move I mean, you do want to, I would be concerned about something getting snagged somewhere. So you do want to clear the clear the area, I guess, but you can fall forward, I suppose, like you said. Did McCoy you, say how he exited? He said he jumped. I mean, whatever that means. It's in a book somewhere, but he- gonna, I haven't. I don't know. You know, I, 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 probably... well, you know, Meltzer, of course, Mark Meltzer always says that he would squid. He would, and, and by squidding, you, you stand backwards on the stairs. And fascinatingly enough, um, Heinemann was witnessed going down the stairs backwards. Now, I don't know if that means he pulled and jumped backwards, but but they did peek out and they saw Heinemann at least going down the stairs backwards. So that may have been how he exited. He, he may have squitted out. I'd be too scared. I'd be too scared because I, like with squatting, yep, totally valid. But if you pull the spring loaded pull, and the pilot shoot gets caught on the wing or a tail tap or something True. like that. Like, I mean, a pilot, a pilot shoot is about, to, it can be up to 30 feet long, depending on the size of the rig, where if you pull out on the steps, you will, I think you need to be clear of the aircraft before you pull the cord. And if he had a squitted, then you would, I think we'd have been dragging the guy's corpse to Reno. Right, right. I'm trying to, I'm watching the, vivid, the video of the guys jumping, the video of the guys 
jumping out the back of the Air America plane. They right there. Well, that's not squidding, I guess, because they have the clear got, before uh, their regs open. Yeah, they have static lines. You know. Yeah. So yeah, I'll watch that again for people. That's, that's such cool footage. Those guys get, you know getting yanked out by the uh, by the by the chutes opening up. That's pretty neat. And they're going down on the on the on the on the sled. Yeah, because the stairs were removed on the Air America versions. Yeah. They're getting yanked as those things open up, which is interesting. But so then we've got, yeah, so slow down a little, whatever. Find the final communication we have with Cooper. Our final words with Cooper is Tina calls back there at about 805 just to check on him. He answers the phone. Hello. <laughs> hello. I mean, I guess that's what you say. I mean, how else do you say? How else, how else, how else do you answer the phone? You go, hello. I mean, it's just. Why does he answer the phone? If I think he answers, like, like, hello. He 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 answered the phone, right? All he had to do was nothing. At the eight oh five, the stairs were open. Yeah. No. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but the way Uncle Sam trains his men is as soon as the hatch is open, you go. He waited. He waited for half an hour. Almost. Who's this? Who? Cooper waited half an hour. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, the stairs are open at seven forty six, seven forty two ish, and yeah. he jumps at eight. Third to th th about half an hour. Yeah. But again, that just, to me, that just shows he's waiting to get closer to Portland. He doesn't want to jump over the wilderness. You know, yeah, like that, he's, he's just standing there, but like, why the hell did he answer the phone? Because I would love to know the, like what the vortex discussion would be like if, because I, let's say I had control over one element of, of the case, other than knowing who the guy was, mm -hmm. I would have it that he didn't answer the phone where see the idea of where he jumped like would the pressure bump have been a thing because at 805 he says hello and answers that stupid phone this silly old well, man answers the phone yeah well let me then, back up a little bit though bump. so tina says that when he so she tries to call him and he, he doesn't answer all there's all the noise going on he doesn't he doesn't actually hear the phone ring the interphone or, or chime i guess it, it, it would chime i guess he doesn't hear it chiming because of all the noise. He's distracted, whatever. So Tina says that she goes on the on the loudspeaker. So Tina has to go on the on the intercom and say, "Sir, we're trying to contact you, or pick up the pick up the phone, or whatever." And he does, and he says, "Hello." And she says, "Are you, are you still having trouble with the air stairs?" He says, "Everything is fine now." And he hangs hangs up, and that's the last we hear of Cooper. So everything is fine now is our last Cooper uh, statement. I thought he, I thought he said uh, did uh, and again this no. could be a Radachak embellishment of is there anything else we can do for you? And Cooper says no. no. Yeah, it's in the three hundred twos. It's no. In Tucson, he has him saying everything's fine now, and it's interesting. Wow. Where again, here's the thing too. I I almost and this is why I like Tucson because Tucson's a writer. He wants to get the actual quotes. The FBI yep. is not interested particularly in, in actual quotes. So they may yep. have said to the FBI, he said, everything's fine now, or I'm good or something. And they're just going to put no. So, because they're handwriting these answers. But then with the, 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 the authorship of the 302s, like with Tosaw's book, it's Tosaw and witness. It's not agent to witness to typist. Yeah, right. Days later. No, so, so, uh, yeah, so I, I would say that's right, but I, 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 I think it's an interesting thought. Like, let's pretend the guy didn't answer the phone, right? He didn't answer nothing. Where at the point of him answering the phone, the flight deck knew he was there, and then they feel this pressure bump. Mm -hmm. Where how many other pressure bumps did they feel? I mean, there was turbulence. I mean, they had an open hatch with gear down and flaps at a certain setting, where that was attributed to him, where. Sure. I mean, we could be in a position if he didn't answer the phone where he could have jumped anywhere. He could have been, he could have jumped at the 813 part. He could have been 80 miles north of Vegas, anywhere. And then perhaps the other copycats may not have been caught. Maybe well, did, I, he, did him answering that phone condemn the copycats to no, death or prison? No, because so the, that call comes at 805, right? And then at 812, 811, we have the oscillations, okay? when they know he's going down the stairs, they feel him going down there. They see on the gauge, they don't feel the oscillations. They see it on the gauge. And what's funny is you we actually have 
when Ratajkowski reports the oscillations, it pulls his earpiece out, which is funny because it even says he even he even apologized. He says my earpiece came out, and what it is is I know what happened was that so Anderson station, the flight engineer was right behind the co-pilot. Okay, it's right behind him, and so right behind him, and so Anderson clearly said, "Hey, look at this." Or he sees the oscillations on this gear that's right in front of Anderson's panel. And so right behind him is, is, the, is the engineer's panel. When he says, hey, look at this or something like this, Ratajkowski turns real quick. And when he turns to look at the oscill- uh, turns to look at the panel, his earpiece pops out. So he says, oh, uh, and then he puts it in and says, hey, we're experiencing oscillations in the cabin rate of climb indicator. Um, so then a few minutes later, they feel the famous pressure bump. So they know Cooper is on the stairs at that moment, I, I, that was their indication. So I don't, I don't, not, I don't think that the air, that the phone call was that critical. It was the oscillations that, that that teed them up to be aware of what was about to happen. But there was famously, uh, there was a little bob. They call it the little bob, and that's not a little coop Ratajkowski. That's the uh, a, a bob in the uh, in the. That was a terrible joke. That was a bob in the uh, in the flight that da- in the flight data recorder. At 809, there was a bit of a some kind of fluctuation that was read on. But again, now that could have been turbulence of some sort. But the oscillations are what teed them up to be, hey, I think he's on the sticks. They even say when Ratchik says, we're experiencing oscillations in the rate of cabin rate of climb indicator, he must be doing something with the stairs. So they think he's on, they they're 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 keyed up for him to jump. And so when they feel the pressure bump, but what's fascinating is that. And maybe one of the most one of the most vortexy things we have is that when they feel the pressure bump, they don't report it for minutes, for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes. But so when Bill Radicek likes to say that when the when when they felt the when they felt the pressure bump, he goes there he goes, and then calls and says. Uh, I think our friend, you might want to mark it on your shrimp boats. I think our friend just took leave of us. Well, if he said that, he said that to nobody because there's no transcripts from air traffic control or anybody that have him saying that. All we know is that around is that around 820 or 821, they call Northwest Airlines and say, hey, there was something happened a few minutes ago. Like another uh, interesting point like and it goes back to the the squatting thing is that an open parachute would be detectable on the onboard radar of the airplane and they would have noticed it and they didn't wait what i'm sorry what so on the onboard radar uh-huh on 305 so on harold anderson's deck right where he, there's the the sp- not the antiquated spinny World War II radar thing, but they can detect, and there's sensors to detect things flying in pl- close proximity to the plane. So, for example, if they drifted too near a weather balloon or a hot air balloon or a paraglider or a private pilot or anything else, but they didn't report an open canopy near them, which would have been picked up by the aircraft. Well... If he had a pulled close to the aircraft What's, itself, unless he fell a while first. Interestingly enough, in a similar vein, uh, Mark Meltzer has pointed out that Sage was Sage radar was precise enough, and that they could actually see skydivers physically, the actual dots of skydivers jumping. That Mark Meltzer had a buddy who was working in the Air Force one time. And it's, and it's something like this, that back in the late, early 70s, or whatever, they were using Sage, that a buddy of his called and said, hey, I saw you guys. Did you guys have about eight guys jumping out? So the Sage radar tech saw his buddy's skydiving plane, was watching it just for the hell of it, and saw the little dots. So if if we had, if somehow we had the actual you know, actual data from Sage, it's possible that if we reviewed it very thoroughly, that we might, we probably could see Cooper exit the aircraft physically, the actual you probably, blip. You probably could. And then uh, I think people might think 
you know, especially with radar. Oh, how can a how can a radar pick up? You know, one little person. Parachutes are really freaking big. Like a like a even a twenty four foot canopy, like a Cessna, isn't yeah. twenty four yeah. feet in length, yeah. <laughs> and you can fit twelve men in it. So it's, I mean, if they can pick up a sixteen and a half feet Cessna, they can pick up a twenty four foot. Canopy no, I mean, look, I mean, these are things the that are designed. I mean, the whole purpose of these part of them was to pick up bombers, but also to pick up missiles. I mean, if they could pick up missiles going 500 miles an hour, a nuclear missile, then, I mean, you know, theoretically they could see a parach parachute. But I, I don't know if it was, John Packer Packer is saying that he's not sure about how a cloudy night would affect that. I'm not sure. It wouldn't? I, I don't know if, if clouds, I don't think that, that, that would be, because you would just launch, you know, the Soviets would launch their attack on a cloudy night. I don't think that has anything to do. I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah, think that. Uh, absolutely no. It was calibrated to take cloud cover into account. Uh, because you, you're right. I, I mean, aerial if, radar, if I, clouds in the sky. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Like if I if I, if I was if I, if I was Russian in 1971, I was like, right, today's the day, guys. We're going to invade the United <laughs> States. It's really cloudy. Let's go. <laughs> and yeah, all their systems are. Kaput. It's like saying it's that like sonar is not going to work because there's water. You know, yeah, it's too wet. <laughs> yeah, it's too. I mean, radar. It's in the air. There's clouds. I mean, I mean, I mean, you would have, you would have. I mean, think about on a, on a stormy night, you'd have planes crashing into each other because the air traffic controllers are, are losing control because we we've lost them. We've lost the fleet. You know, I, yeah, I don't think clouds would make a difference. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I could be totally wrong, but I I'm not sure if clouds make a huge difference. Maybe on something as small as a person, perhaps. Maybe they would. Maybe, 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 I, maybe. Because again, I think they're using. I don't know. Yeah, maybe so. I don't know. But anyway, so everything is fine now. I choose to believe that over no being Cooper's last words on this earth. Yeah, possibly. I, I, I like it. I like it. Be. I, I. I like that too. Just a no, and then, and then putting the phone down. It's like, you know, he he was he was polite he was but it it just begs the question who the hell was this guy like i mean this is not the way he carried himself now there there were military copycats who did the whole i kill all you motherfuckers act and were very menacing terrifying which involved waving guns brandishing grenades and tying a noose around the captain's neck Right. Uh, and the the copycats who were very much suffering PTSD at that time and who were petrified, terrified, felt abandoned by their government, whereas Cooper was polite, didn't brand well. Other than the bomb, now there's no doubt. I mean, we can take to the bank. He had a he had a, he had a pistol in his trench coat. Without a doubt, he can't not have had just yeah. in case. But the he he is not behaving like someone with PTSD at all. No, 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 no. It's not fresh on his mind. Uh, certainly not. He's a crook. I, I think where, 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 where I stand now, if I could invent Cooper from my knowledge as I square things up, I would say that most of these Air America pilots, so Air America, the CIA's military wing, what we know about them is that they were military contractors. They're mercenaries, basically. They weren't, they were, they weren't in the military, but they're working for the military, much like Blackwater in Iraq or something like that. They're a mercenary force. Of, of, and, and who joins mercenary forces? It, it, former military adventurer types, soldiers of fortune. And so all the pilots in Air America. And look, we, we, we looked it up. I mean, I think the number was like 400 of these guys were killed in Vietnam, the Air America. They had 400 guys that were killed air crew um, that... From looking at articles, I've read an article from 1972 where they say that some somebody's discussing Air America and he says the average age of our pilots is like 42, 43. They're older guys and they're doing a dangerous job, but it pays well. It, pays, it paid really well, apparently. And that I think that, and these guys were, again, what is a mercenary? That is a guy who risks his life for profit. Yeah. And this like, is really... Michael, that's what Cooper was risking his life for profit and was comfortable doing so. And with Air America, on a, on, on a side note, is that uh, yeah, Air America is coming up in the conversation 
a lot. And this wasn't a small, tiny, you know, group of people like Underpin. Like Air America had 5,000 employees. Yeah. I mean, they had 5,000 I mean, employees and a massive fleet. Yeah. I mean, they probably would have had several hundred pilots, I would think. Flying Easy. helicopters, planes. Yeah. But all these guys were older, retired military guys who were still chasing the thrill. World War II money. people. Was that? World War II people. Yeah, right. Or Korean War, um, 50s era guys for yeah. sure. Um, so that's what I, I'm thinking this guy is a, he's a, some kind of. World uh, War II, he wanted to get back into the shit. Well, I would say, but see, the fact that he knew the, the fact that he knew that about the flight configurations for dropping for Air America drops, 15 degree flaps, gear down. Too precise. It's yeah, that's too, too precise. precise. It really indicates that he was one of those guys, something like that. So some questions for uh, people. So one, uh, Jay says, did Cooper have an accent? Um, no, no yeah. accent. It was very, it was described as a low voice, a low voice, pleasant voice, low, pleasant voice without Polite. any accent or affectation. Uh, Tina said that she thought he may have been from the, mid from the Midwest or a Western state. And I am of the opinion that stewardesses being travelers probably pick up on accents pretty well. And yeah. she could not pick it up. So, um, Ryan, do you think Cooper will ever be caught? Well, no, he's dead, but identified probably. I, 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 I think, think so. so. He's, he knows too much. He's not... So McNally, okay, so if McNally got away, never in a million years would we ever trace Robert Wilson hijacker to Martin McNally, unemployed gas station attendant from Wyandotte, Michigan. Never in a million years. But Cooper's knowledge narrows it down. Uh, possibly the tie particles can narrow it down. There's, so there are clues that narrow him down a little bit more than other than, than, than someone like McNally who would have just jumped out. Um, you know, so I do think, I mean, there's only a certain number of people who could be Cooper, in my opinion, under, under 5,000, probably under several hundred, perhaps even. So, uh, Jude, what do you think Cooper being identified one day? Absolutely. I, I think he could be where, I mean, loads of cases have been solved many, many decades later. Uh, whether it's the finding of remains or DNA, uh, it's totally possible. There's there's no crime that's unsolvable, and that to me includes Jack the Ripper, and that was 125 years ago this year. And no. they are making strides in that with DNA and everything 135, else. 135, my friend, wasn't that 1889? 135, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Wow. So it, it's. It, it's totally, totally possible. There, there have been breakthroughs in many, many cases. Like even the the, the Franklin expedition, yeah, where there right. have been remains that, and that's eight, more, older again, eighteen forty eight. So mm -hmm. uh, the, there, there will be more answers of that. There's no doubt. Uh, so, you, so, so you're so you're saying that the Jack the Ripper is not Aaron Kosminski? You, you don't buy that? I, I do buy it. I think so too. I I I absolutely buy in. I I think we'll get to a Kosminski level with Cooper. That we will get a Kosminski where this. I think the and the Ripper community most accept the outcome. Yes, you will get the you know the 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 usual suspects for want of a better term that will question everything without a shadow of a doubt like in the vortex let's say for example somebody finds an old photograph of a geeky old man with sunglasses sitting in portland airport and it can be conclusively identified with facial recognition technology and ai there will still be people who question it or let's say there was a secret cctv old antiquated super 8 camera on the flight that picked up his voice and was conclusively this is without a shadow of a doubt this person there will be the people that will say oh no aliens planted that and altered the footage yeah like yeah. that's db cooperville that's where we live yeah i mean it's gonna be i think we're able, we're gonna have more convince it's gonna be more convincing with cooper because we are closer to reality i mean we're closer to the time period so we're gonna have more information about you know 
Bill Jones as opposed to Aaron Kosminski, for example, and Cooper in the yeah. Ripper case, because it's so old, it's old that we don't know people who knew him and things like that. So, you know, we're there. So um, let's see. Da, 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 da. All right. Anybody else? I like saw that? a comment and I'd love yeah. to find it again. Somebody, uh, did somebody say they were a pilot with United in San Francisco? I did not see that. No, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think anybody in here is a, a pilot from... Oh, hold on, I, I'm I'm looking for it. Somebody said, "Okay, hold on." I'm of the Cooper era. I remember all the terminology and the language. Oh, Judith Galbraith said, "I flew a lot at that time, actually in that area of the country." My uncle worked for United in okay. San Francisco. Okay, so I, I'm going to have to do a pressure bump video because uh, Mini Pup, thank you for being a subscriber, Mini Pup. She says, "Well, what was the pressure bump caused by him unscrewing a panel and hiding on the plane?" <laughs> No, no, we're not laughing at you. He left the plane. He left. He did. He fucking he did. left. Yeah. Stop. Stop. He yeah. left. He jumped. He's gone. Yeah. He, he left. He's, yeah. He's he's gone. Yeah. They now the we know now this is not the best image here, uh, many. But look, so if you watch the video of this guy jumping, now this doesn't go all the way to the top, but in this video, this guy jumping. Watch watch the stairs. They rebound a little bit like a diving board. Okay. Now, this plane was going a lot slower, I'm guessing, than the Cooper plane. And oh, the yeah. wind is not pushing it up. And this guy might not have been as heavy as Cooper. So Cooper's plane did that. It, when, when the door closed, I'll, I'll bring this image up for you, Minnie. When the, door, when the stairs closed, they slammed up against the, the fuselage there. And they created what's called a pressure bump. They forced air back into the plane. And when that happened, the pilots felt a popping in their ears. And that's what's called the pressure bump. Now, they weren't exactly sure of what it was for a while, and, but then they did testing on it. They did a test, and this is the picture of the sled test. They did, they did testing of them, and it was not a very good one, but you can see the door, the stairs, when the sled gets pushed off, this, it, it slams up against it. And we know that this is when Cooper jumped because – on all the subsequent cop, there were five guys who did the same crime after Cooper. And the way that they were caught, one of the ways they were caught is that the knowing what happened with Cooper about this pressure bump, they, the FBI told the pilots, hey, when this hijacker jumps out, you're going to feel a popping in your ears because the stairs are going to rebound. And sure enough, each time they jumped, they called the FBI saying, hey, we just felt, what you're, we just felt that. He just jumped. So law enforcement's on the ground waiting for them. So no, uh, pressure bump was definitely caused by him jumping. For he left the plane where that's like, and I, I, I don't know we talked about this for a video, was like there should be a 10 commandments of Cooperville. And I did see a couple of comments where you get the, he never jumped and the crew were in on it. Like they're just, no. Okay. They're just no. Mini, mini pump is, is freaking Tim. Uh, from Tim Calmer from our Facebook group for anybody thinking yes Tim is Tim is always a jokester so okay that's Tim okay now I know who you are Tim I didn't know that because I mean we I you just wasted my breath Tim thanks a lot on the practice hey maybe there's some listeners who don't get it um Jay Jay Weiss and Sean Fowler are both asking about Cooper being Canadian possibly I mean look I don't I, it I, I don't I wouldn't doubt that that's not there's nothing to nothing to disprove that I mean Canadians not all of them have, well, what are you talking about? You know, they, they don't all sound like that. <laughs> so no, I, it's possible. He could, he could be. You know, and and, if, and for those who, there are some connections who say that him saying he wanted U.S. currency is a brain fart on his part because he's used to dealing with two forms of currency. He, he will deal with Canadian or pounds, I guess, whatever they used back then. And he, and he coming to America, he had to use currency. So this is a guy who would exchange money, I guess. So if you're, I mean, I guess that, you know, I mean, there you go. I mean, Jude, you live in Northern Ireland. Yes, I do. You use the pound, but five both. minutes away from you, you use euros, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we can use both island wide anywhere. Right. Where, so the where fact is. The, the negotiable, uh, it's, it's a used term yeah so i'm saying for, for you you have to specify sometimes if i want pounds or yeah. if i want euros yes so that and then and that and to mess it up even more is that 
sometimes we have to specify that we want uh, Northern Ireland sterling notes or English sterling notes because they are different and some places don't accept different sterling notes where what the negotiable or circulated I think I don't think he just said I want 200 grand on a knapsack by five I think there were because I let's say I give the fake name as Martin McNally I would say I want 200,000 pounds in English notes hmm because you're because you're used to dealing with se separate currencies. Yeah, yeah. Because they would fuck me over and give me right. the NI ones that I can't spend in England, or it depends where I go. Where I would say I want the English notes, and it's it's the same with well with euros as well. It doesn't really matter, but you I would want Irish euro notes, not German euro notes or coins. It's I, I would want our ones. Interesting. I mean, and again, the fact is we have, I would, I would need to look up. I almost certainly McCoy, like Americans are very vain. We think we're the only people on earth. Really? Really? <laughs> yes. Guess what? There's other countries. I, I live in a country called Ireland. That's in Europe. That's not in America. <laughs> you live in Northern Ireland. Is that right? Or do you live in Ireland now? Did you move? Uh, no, it's uh, I mean it's it's yeah, it's got. really complicated. Yeah, but, you know what? Do you know what's hilarious? Yes. Do you know what's hilarious? Somebody, I'm speechless. Can you put Vegas Gorby's comment on the screen where it says, "Jude, I watched oh, yeah. Braveheart today. William Wallace was awesome." I, that's I'm probably speechless. a joke. It probably is, but I wouldn't be surprised. It's America. Uh, yeah, that movie is disastrous. It's it, very inaccurate. It's, it, it it is, yeah. It's a, it's a Scotland one because even at CooperCon, people had said, you know, oh, are you Scottish or whatever? Or like after saying the Irish connection that, that they were still doing Scottish stuff where I was, uh, somebody had said, oh, where are you from? I said, I'm from Derry. That's Northern it, it was Ireland. A joke. Like, said, oh, it was a joke. and it was like, oh, my aunt's from Edinburgh. And I was like, different That's countries. Scotland. Yeah, it's like, different oh, well. Place. Oh, you're from Mississippi? My aunt's from Ontario. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> congratulations. Uh, I, I hate people so much. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, Packer Jack says the end of that movie was not pleasant. <laughs> the, end of, the end of Braveheart was not pleasant for William Wallace. Uh, drawn and quartered is not, uh, not a, treason against the crown is not a pleasant activity to engage in for sure. But yeah, so uh, there we have it, folks. I would say that uh, that's the words of Cooper. He was a man of few words. He didn't say much, but what he said, I think, is indicative of that this guy knew aviation. He, What he did say showed that he had a knowledge. He possessed skills enough to know that, you know. Yeah, like, again, I, I, this is probably the best final word in the history of final words, which was at the end of Larry Carr's presentation at CooperCon last year, which was this man probably had just about enough knowledge to be a danger to himself and other people when it came to aviation and parachutes. Yeah, I mean, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, he definitely had enough knowledge. I mean, I don't, I do not believe yeah. I can't. God, I am, I'm, I'm, I used to be open to the idea that maybe he was got lucky or studied up on it, but. Again, no the flight way. configurations are too precise. Knowing where the oxygen bottles are, allegedly, uh, I mean, he may he may he may, he may have just been saying that, but I don't think so. Knowing about refueling procedures, knowing that knowing that you can pick a flight plan up in the air, it's too much. Yeah, you know, it's way too, too much. much. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, that doesn't mean that he was some super genius and had this drop zone, you know, figured out. I mean, but. He knew aviation, at least. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any, I, I don't know. He, 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 he knew just about enough to complete the objective. And in other hijackings, some ending in tragedy, which I'll not mention on the video, where they, they had just about enough knowledge to see through their objective. And Cooper was likely the same. Yeah. And finally, what Jay says, could, could Cooper have used the money in Mexico at the time? Well, hey man, American yes. dollars spend anywhere. Yeah, I can bit. spend American dollars here. Like whenever I came back from CooperCon, I was able to spend American dollars here. Uh, that's the one advantage, uh, other than there being Wendy's over there, is you can spend. I can spend American dollars here. 
um, with no issue. Yes, I will not get dollar change back, but I can hand over a, a $50 uh, bill and get euro change back because really? dollars and euros are exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and if, and if I, yeah, Jude does love him some square hamburgers, don't you? You're you're you're, you're enamored with in Wendy's. Of course I am. I, I, with Wendy's, Taco Bell, and all the main cool, like Twinkies, we can't have either Reese's Pieces, like American candy, as you call it, and fast food. It's full of crap that's banned and illegal here because it causes so many health concerns. Sure. Um, but it tastes great, and that's why I I'm always so excited to go to America. Anytime I land, like when if Eric Ulis is watching this, when Eric Ulis picks me up from the airport for CooperCon. I'll be saying, Eric, do you know where we're going? We're going to Wendy's. We're going right now. And there's one near the airport. And that's because we went there the last time I was there. So absolutely. Yeah. Nicole Egg says Baconator. Oh, no. It's a double Baconator. <laughs> it wants the double. It's the double with the big bucket of Dr. Pepper with it. So, uh, yeah, that, that that's that's why I'm so enamored by it. Because what makes American food taste so good is because most of the ingredients in it are illegal in the European Union. Well... It's like Heinemann wanted $303,000 in $500 bills and $1,000 bills. And he also wanted newspapers to read about himself. Jude the hijacker wants his money and he wants a Baconator too, a double Baconator. Yeah. yeah. From, and I wouldn't have been, and like we discussed earlier, I wouldn't have been the first hijacker to request cheeseburgers. And on that note, folks, on that joke, we will uh, exit and have a good night. And thank you, Jude. I really appreciated it. And this was Jude's idea. Thank so you, thank you, thank you. I do I oh, do appreciate you. that. And uh oh. stay tuned, folks, and be good. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. Adios. Subscribe. Follow the channel and subscribe. Yes, yes. like and subscribe. All that YouTube. Like and subscribe. Stuff. Plug, 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 plug. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Ryan. I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Che cheers. <laughs>